R. E. Lee, A Biography, Volume 1, Chapters 32 through 36. Written by Douglas Southall Freeman. Published by Charles Scribner Sons, New York and London, 1934. Digitalization by Bill Thayer. Audiobook produced by Open Audio Recordings and read by Nancy, a Microsoft Azure AI Neural Voice. Chapter 32, Lee Discloses a Weakness. On the morning of July 28, 1861, Lee started from Richmond to perform his first field duty for the Confederacy. It was not an impressive departure. No commissaries or quartermasters attended him. His only military companions were Colonel Washington and Captain Taylor. He had no more than two private attendants, Meredith, his cook, a Negro from the White House plantation, and Perry, another Negro, who had been employed in the dining room at Arlington and was now acting as Lee's body servant. Except for his horses, his baggage was of the smallest proportions. The only recorded part of it was a simple mess kit of tin, destined to serve him until after Appomattox. Many a brigadier, starting for the front, had a far larger entourage and a more ostentatious leave-taking. If any of the family came to see Lee off, it was Custis, for Mrs. Lee, Robert, and the girls were visiting friends, and Rooney's cavalry was in the Allegheny Mountains. It was not precisely to the command of an army that Lee was going. He had no written instructions. As the president's confidential military adviser, still in titular command of all the Confederate forces in the Old Dominion, he was being sent to western Virginia, where Garnett had fallen and where small, separate commands were feebly struggling to prevent a federal advance. His mission was to coordinate rather than to command, not to direct operations in person but to see if rivalries could not be suppressed and united effort against the enemy assured. The nature of his assignment had been correctly reported in at least one newspaper, but it was not generally understood by the public. The assumption that he was directly in command led the public to expect great achievements of him, but the fact that immediate charge of the troops was not entrusted to him by the president made such achievements almost impossible. Authority and responsibility were divided, with the usual disastrous results. So much trouble could have been avoided if he had temporarily been assigned to command the scattered units in western Virginia that it is difficult to say why this was not done. Perhaps President Davis did not wish Lee formally detached, perhaps he felt that Lee's known tact could best be employed if he appeared on the scene to counsel all the general officers in western Virginia and not to supersede any of the touchy individuals who were exercising semi-independent command in the mountains. The Confederate authorities, in July, 1861, had not developed the courage to deal bluntly with men of this stamp, but proceeded cautiously in an effort to preserve the complete unity of the South. In this instance, the welfare of the forces was subordinated to the ambitions of the leaders. It was to prove a costly concession to pride. As far as Gordonsville, Lee's journey lay along the route he had followed when he had come to Richmond from Alexandria on that memorable 22d of May. West of Gordonsville, he continued on the Virginia Central Railroad by way of Charlottesville to Staunton, where he detrained on the evening of July 28. He knew, of course, that he was not making a tour of an army possessed of the proud confidence that Johnston and Beauregard's men felt, now that they had achieved a victory at Bull Run. A measure of demoralization he anticipated. A lack of equipment he was certain to find, because he had learned that some blundering quartermaster had forwarded to General T. J. Jackson at Winchester certain essential supplies intended for General H. R. Jackson at Monterey. From the hour he arrived at Staunton, however, Lee encountered a state of affairs unlike anything he had ever seen in war. Into the quiet valley town had rolled the backwash of Garnett's little command, men whose zeal for war had been quickly dampened by contact with its dirty, bloody realities, ragged men, hungry men, the sick and the roadworn. One Georgia regiment, shattered in mountains, had straggled back in such utter despair that its bewildered colonel had granted all its men a furlough without consulting his superiors. General Loring, who had preceded Lee a few days on his way to the army, had countermanded all the furloughs and had put the baffled colonel under arrest, but had been very doubtful of his ability to get the men together again. It was not soldiery that Lee saw at Staunton, it was panic exhausted and paralysis. With the detachment of mind he always sought to cultivate, Lee did not let himself think solely of these things as, on the morning of July 29, he left Staunton and started on horseback for Monterey.
A part of the road, as far as Buffalo Gap, I passed over in the summer of 1840 on my return to St. Louis, after bringing you home, Lee wrote his wife. If anyone had then told me that the next time I traveled that road would have been on my present errand, I should have supposed him insane. I enjoyed the mountains, as I rode along. The views are magnificent, the valleys so beautiful, the scenery so peaceful. What a glorious world Almighty God has given us. How thankless and ungrateful we are, and how we labor to mar his gifts. There was rain that first day, but it did not delay him. He regarded it simply as an incident of the journey and not as an omen of what lay ahead. At Monterey, a little village in Highland County, ten miles east of the principal ridge of the Allegheny Mountains, he came to the headquarters of Brigadier General Henry R. Jackson of Georgia, commander on that part of the front. A strange fortune it was that brought such a man into so precipitous a wilderness. For Judge Jackson was a Yale graduate, an art lover, a poet, an ex-judge and former United States minister to Austria. Not long before the war, when still under forty, he had declined the chancellorship of the University of Georgia. The people of Savannah had elected him to the Confederate Congress, but as he had served as the youthful colonel of the first Georgia Volunteers during the Mexican War, he had felt that he should enter the army. With a brigadier's commission, he had brought Georgia troops to western Virginia just before Garnett had been defeated. As the senior officer of the reserve, he had been forced to take charge of operations at a time when the Confederate forces had been in chaos, with every prospect of a quick federal pursuit to the Virginia Central Railroad. General Jackson would have been far more at ease if he had been asked to translate an obscure passage in an Horatian ode, or if he had been called upon to draft a diplomatic note in the most precise continental style, but, in a new capacity and in an unfamiliar country, he had kept his head, had used his strong, native intelligence, and had made in the crises what were, all things considered, probably the best dispositions possible with the small force at hand. Although he had acted with decision, Jackson had displayed unusual modesty. He had urged that Lee come in person to Western Virginia and he had suggested that a man of greater military experience than himself be placed in direct command. Those of the troops that had not shared in Garnett's campaign, only two regiments at the outset, were in good condition. So were the reinforcements that were now coming up from Staunton under orders issued after the disaster at Carricksford. But many of the survivors of Garnett's command, as Lee had already seen, were in a pitiable plight, without tents or camp equipage, and with but the clothing on their backs, the horses of their artillery and cavalry jaded and galled. After their escape from the enemy, their recovery of morale was slow. Added to their other miseries was an epidemic of measles, a malady that went hard with the soldiers from the rural districts of the South, most of whom had escaped it in childhood. Fever debilitated many that escaped the measles. Hospital facilities were too crude for classification. The soldiers who kept their health were wet and dejected, for the rain that Lee had encountered on the ride from Staunton had been falling steadily since July 22. Some of the younger officers, like Rooney Lee and Edward Johnson, were already displaying the high promise they later fulfilled, but most of the others were a shock and perhaps a disillusionment to Lee. Instead of trained soldiers who could be relied upon to understand orders and to obey them promptly, he found that the tools of command were zealous and patriotic enough, but were men to whom everything had to be explained, men who took their time to follow instructions, apparently unconscious that the very life of the army, much less its military success, depended upon precision. It is so difficult, Lee wrote his wife, to get our untrained people to comprehend and promptly execute the measures required for the occasion. The feebleness of the army seemed all the worse when measured against the assumed strength of the enemy. And the strength of the enemy was increased by the geographical position he then occupied in that forbidding land. The Confederates had advanced westward from the Virginia Central and from the Virginia and Tennessee railroads. The Federals had moved to the occupation of the disputed section of the Old Dominion eastward from the Kanawha River and southeastward from the line of the Baltimore and Ohio. The two forces had come together on the watershed of the Allegheny Mountains, an imposing range that runs northeast and southwest through the whole of Virginia. The contest was for the mountain passes and the roads that wound through them. On the northern part of the front, where Lee then was, the range was divided, from east to west, into four principal chains of mountains, the Alleghenies, strictly so-called, Greenbrier Mountain, Cheat Mountain, and Rich Mountain.
the distance from the crest of the Alleghenies to the top of Cheat Mountain was 15 miles. These heights were traversed by one of the historic highways of Virginia, the Staunton Parkersburg Turnpike, which joined the two towns its name hyphenated. The strongest of the passes through which this road ran was that on Cheat Mountain, where there was a long crossing at an elevation in excess of 3,500 feet, easily swept away by artillery on the summit. The first conflict had been for Rich Mountain. Then had come a race for Cheat Mountain. This had been decided before Lee's arrival. The Federals had occupied the eminence while the Confederates were demoralized by the early successes of McClellan. Jackson had been compelled to take second choice, which was the pass over the Alleghenies. Greenbrier Mountain, which did not possess great military strength, could also be occupied by the Southerners as an advanced position, but only because the Federals had not thought it worth taking so long as they held Cheat Mountain. All the advantage of position was on the northern side. Fifty miles to the southwest of this sector the James River and Connaught Turnpike ran through the mountains from Covington to the head of light navigation on the Gully River, one of the two main streams that unite to form the Kanoa River. In that area, where the mountains did not set their parapets so high as in front of Monterey, General Henry A. Wise had been conducting a campaign presently to be described. It was generally assumed that the Staunton Parkersburg Road and the James River and Connaught Turnpike were the only highways an army could follow across the mountains. That was not the case. West of Cheat Mountain a fairly good road ran from the village of Huttonsville southward up Tigert's Valley and through a cross range of mountains to a small place known as Huntersville. From that point a difficult but passable road led over the Alleghenies, via Warm Springs, to Millboro, which was close to the Virginia Central Railroad, southwest of Staunton. The essential features of the terrain may be seen from the sketch on page 547 on which the Staunton Parkersburg and the James River Canal roads are marked with double lines and the Huntersville Millboro Road appears as a series of dashes. If the Federals could push forward up the Kanawha Valley and thence up New River they could reach the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad, which was the only direct line of communication between the two states whose name it bore. Again, a federal advance from Huntersville to Millboro would cut off the supplies that were going from Jackson's River, the western terminus of the Virginia Central Railroad, to the Confederate Army in the Kanawha Valley. A federal advance to Millboro would likewise bring the enemy dangerously close to the rear of the forces in front of Cheat Mountain, who were being supplied in large part from Staunton. Finally, a drive along the Staunton-Parkersburg Road, resulting in the occupation of Staunton, would sever all rail communication between eastern and western Virginia and would deprive the south of rich grain crops of the Shenandoah Valley. In short, any advance of the enemy to the Virginia Central Railroad would be, or would threaten, a major Confederate disaster. The possibilities of a Confederate offensive were equally great. If Cheat Mountain could be passed there was no insurmountable barrier on the road to the Baltimore and Ohio, at Grafton, some 90 miles from Jackson's outposts at the Greenbrier River. At Grafton, as the Confederates had realized since the beginning of the war, they could sever one of the main railways linking the east to the west. If, again, the Confederates could advance down the Kanawha 85 miles from Gully Bridge, while covering their flank against attack from the north, they would reach the Ohio and would effectually free the greater part of western Virginia from the grip of the enemy. General H. R. Jackson had been quick to sense the importance of the little-known and little-used road from Huntersville to Millboro. Even when his force had been very small he had divided it to protect this route and had urged that reinforcements be sent forward directly from the railroad near Millboro. He had heard, moreover, that from Huntersville a road led northward down Tigert's Valley to the rear of Cheat Mountain, and he had ordered the troops at Huntersville to advance and seize a position that commanded this route. Leaving out of account, therefore, the units in or adjacent to the Kanawha Valley and those on the march to join Jackson or to strengthen Loring, who had gone to Huntersville before Lee reached Monterey, the disposition of the troops was about as shown on the opposite page. In this situation, of course, where the strength of the Federals was unknown, the first step had to be defensive. Lee must make certain that the troops were numerous enough, vigilant enough, and well enough fortified in the mountains to keep the Union forces from reaching the Virginia Central Railroad. He had naturally been acutely conscious of this danger before he left Richmond and he had forwarded urgent and explicit orders to hold the mountain passes and to take no chances. It was not until some time after his arrival at the front that he was entirely satisfied the enemy could not break through the defenses and strike the railway.
Offensively, the key position in the campaign manifestly was the high ground north of Huntersville, dominating the road in rear of Cheat Mountain. If the troops that Jackson had sent forward had chosen a good position there was every reason to hope that a quick advance might turn Cheat Mountain before the enemy was aware of the danger from the direction of Huntersville. To ascertain the exact state of affairs Lee bade Jackson adieu on the morning of August 3 and set out for Huntersville with his few companions. The rain that he had first encountered the day he left Staunton was falling still and was enveloping in damp gloom a country of great natural beauty. The roads, which were bad at best, were becoming very heavy. The return of fair weather began to assume importance as a factor in the campaign. Lee found Huntersville crowded with sick soldiers, a most wretched and filthy town, according to a Confederate chaplain. Situated about 25 miles from Monterey, it is on Knapp Creek within an hour's trot of the Greenbrier River and has an elevation of 2,200 feet. The road from the north, in which Lee was interested, had its forks here. One branch was the strategically important route over the Alleghenies to Millborough. The other ran southward to the Valley of the Kanawha. The place was worth the risks Jackson had taken when he had divided his little army in order to dispatch troops thither. As soon as Lee reached the village he went to call on General Loring, who, on July 30, had established his headquarters there. He met with a surprised and distinctly cold reception. Loring had not expected to see him and was not pleased to greet him. Not two weeks had passed since Lee had given Loring discretionary orders in Richmond and had sent him forward. And now, before Loring had developed his plans, here was Lee to see that he did his duty. Loring did not feel that he needed supervision. A native of South Carolina but a resident of Florida since boyhood, he had been an Indian fighter while Lee was a headquarters staff lieutenant, and though he was 11 years Lee's junior and was not a West Pointer, he had seen far more field service than his commanding officer, thus suddenly descended on him from the clouds and the mountain top. Had not Loring been brevetted colonel for gallantry in Mexico? When he had been entrusted with command of the Department of Oregon had he not successfully marched a column across the continent? Did he not have a good record as commander in New Mexico, where he had whipped Indians more elusive than the raw federal troops, and in a country more difficult? It was apparent from the moment of Lee's meeting with Loring that another difficulty had been added to the inexperience, the demoralization, and the sickness of the Confederates, to endless rains, to roads like bogs, and to pathless mountains, jealously had come into the campaign, and had come at a time when it might cost the army a great opportunity. For it developed that Colonel William Gillum, whom Jackson had ordered in advance from Huntersville, had gone forward 18 miles and had come to a ridge known as Valley Mountain, across which the Huttonsville-Huntersville Road passed at an elevation of 3,460 feet near the present post office of Mace. From Valley Mountain northward, as reported, the road descended into the lush Tigerts River Valley in rear of the federal position in Cheat Mountain Pass. Not an enemy had been in sight when Gillum had arrived. If he had been strong enough, then he could have swept forward and could have trapped the Federals on Cheat Mountain, opening a way for Jackson on the Greenbrier side. The Federals, however, had quickly learned of Gillum's presence on Valley Mountain and were said to be preparing to fortify a position farther down Tigert's Valley to prevent a Confederate advance. Even now, if Loring would advance with all his forces, the enemy might be driven back and the road could be opened. Everything depended on speed and Loring showed not the slightest disposition to move fast. Weary teams dragged their loads through the mud of the baffling roads, discharged their boxes and barrels, and started protestingly back towards Millboro. Loring's staff officers, some of whom were quite capable, were kept busy in tallying deliveries and in collecting beef cattle, chafing all the while. Loring intended to advance. He confided that much to Lee. But before he went forward, he was determined to establish a base at Huntersville and to stock it adequately with supplies brought up from Staunton over the swimming roads. When he would be ready to move, Loring did not say, though the passage of every hour made it more certain that Federals would realize the full extent of danger and effectually block an advance. The great opportunity was being lost for fear the soldiers might miss their breakfast. Of course, a long offensive could not be sustained without building up a reserve of supplies as Loring proposed, for communications would be difficult to maintain over the execrable roads. To that extent Loring was right. 
but a brief advance was all that was necessary to seize the key positions, and that was worth the risks, even if the men had to carry their own rations. Lee's alternatives were plain, he must wait on Loring, smooth down his ruffled feathers, win his confidence, and coax him into action, when and if he could, or else he must disregard Loring's jealousy, overrule his authority, and by virtue of his superior rank order the troops forward. Zachary Taylor would not have hesitated. Neither would Scott. Neither would Lee's hero, Washington. Had Lee employed stern military methods with Loring, as Stonewall Jackson did the following February, when he preferred charges against that officer for neglect of duty, there can be no doubt that President Davis would have sustained him, timid though the administration then was. But Lee could not bring himself to impose his will on Loring. The general was jealous, controversies were to be avoided, Lee's orders were to coordinate rather than to command, and, if Loring would not advance, some other way of worsting the enemy must be found. Instead of hurrying Loring to Valley Mountain, he set out to conciliate him and to shape a new plan of campaign in place of the one the Federals had carelessly presented and Loring was negligently letting slip by. So Lee waited on Loring. Dealing most deferentially with his sensitive associate, he issued orders assigning troops to the Army of the Northwest under Brigadier General W. W. Loring, and he reminded one of the leaders in the Kanaw Valley that General Loring was commanding the whole force of the Northwest Army. In a word, he chose the role of diplomatist instead of that of army commander and sought to abate Loring's jealousy by magnifying that officer's authority. All his life Lee had lived with gentle people, where kindly sentiments and consideration for the feelings of others were part of noblesse oblige. In that atmosphere he was expansive, cheerful, buoyant even, no matter what happened. During the Mexican campaigns, though his sympathies had been with General Scott, he had largely kept himself apart from the contention and had been a peacemaker. Now that he encountered surliness and jealousy, it repelled him, embarrassed him, and well-nigh bewildered him. Detesting a quarrel as undignified and unworthy of a gentleman, he showed himself willing, in this new state of affairs, to go to almost any length, within the bounds of honor, to avoid a clash. In others, this might have been a virtue, in him it was a positive weakness, the first serious weakness he had ever displayed as a soldier. It was a weakness that was to be apparent more than once and had to be combated, deliberately or subconsciously. His personal humility and his exaggerated sense of his obligations as a man and a Christian were to make him submit to a certain measure of intellectual bullying by those of his associates who were sour and self-opinionated. The more inconsiderate such people were of him, the more considerate he was of them, and the more forbearant, up to the point where his patience failed and his temper broke bounds. Then he would freeze men quickly in the cold depths of his wrath. Prior to this time no man, probably, had guessed it of him, and doubtless he was unconscious of this weakness, but from those days at Huntersville until Longstreet was wounded in the wilderness on May 6, 1864, there always was a question whether Lee, in any given situation, would conquer his inordinate amiability or would permit his campaigns to be marred or his battles to be lost by it. Of some other commanders in the great American tragedy one might have to ask whether they were drunk or sober on a given day, whether they were indolent or aggressive, whether they lost their heads in the emergency or mastered themselves. Of Lee it became necessary to ask, for two years and more, whether his judgment as a soldier or his consideration as a gentleman dominated his acts. Chapter 33 Lee Conducts His First Campaign For days Lee waited on Loring, for days Loring waited on his wagon train. Growing desperate then, Lee set out on August 6 for Valley Mountain, where he arrived the same day. He now found himself in the wilds, surrounded by peaks. Eastward was a mountain of 4,775 feet, southeastward was one still higher, southwestward were the twin crests of Middle Mountain. West of the long ridge of Valley Mountain a ravine ran down to Elk River, beyond which loomed the grim barrier of Gully Mountain. Only to the northward, where the heights dropped away to the valley of Tigert's River, was there an open road. The pass itself was directly on the line between Randolph and Pocahontas counties, at an elevation of 3,464 feet. Human habitations were few and rude. The troops found such shelter as they could under the scanty canvas allotted them. Lee had his solitary tent pitched like the others, and in it he, Colonel Washington, and Captain Taylor made their quarters. Primitive as was the life on which they now entered they did not forget the amenities.
Every morning and every evening Lee and Washington had their separate private devotions, and they sat down to hard fare, crudely served from Lee's musket of tin, with as much dignity as if they had been dining at Mount Vernon or at Arlington. A single reconnaissance sufficed to show that the opportunity for a surprise attack on the western side of Cheat Mountain was fading fast. The Federals had their outposts where any advance would be reported promptly, and down Tigert's Valley they were supposed to be throwing up batteries that commanded the approaches. Perhaps at that time, and certainly a few days thereafter, to make a direct, daylight advance down the mountainside into Tigert's Valley would have been to invite destruction even if the Confederate force on Valley Mountain had been much larger than the few shivering regiments that Lee found there. If the best plan of campaign had to be cancelled because of the delay in massing troops on Valley Mountain, what could be substituted for it? This was the first time during the war that Lee had to ask himself that question, but ere the struggle was over he had to put it in many a doubtful hour. To some extent his strategical methods and to a much larger degree his tactics, throughout the war, had to be adjusted to the second best way of doing things, because an inexperienced subordinate had blundered or a disgruntled commander had sulked. Here in the fastnesses, hemmed in by mountains that a fox could hardly cross, the solitary alternative to a march down Tigert's Valley, straight into the mouth of the Federal guns, was the discovery of some obscure, unguarded trail to the rear of Cheat Mountain. The only way of finding such a route, if one existed, was to reconnoiter with the greatest care. As Lee had about him scarcely any officers experienced in this difficult work he felt that he should do a part of it. Overnight, he turned back the wheels of fortune a full fourteen years and once again was a captain of engineers reconnoitering a country not altogether unlike Mexico. The native population was divided in sentiment and as apt to mislead as to aid. Every track had to be followed to the last impassable ravine, every description of the land had to be verified to the last pretended turn of a non-existent road. Early in the morning Lee went out, often wet and weary, it was late before he returned with Washington and Taylor. One day the trio were half a mile in advance of the Confederate pickets, very busily studying the ground ahead of them, when suddenly a Confederate captain and two privates, armed cap a pied, broke suddenly out of a nearby thicket, stood doubtful for a moment, and then made their embarrassed explanations, from the picket lines they had seen the three figures on the mountain and, mistaking them for Federal scouts, had started out to capture them. Hourly, as if it were the ally of the North, the rain continued to pour down. By August 10, when twenty successive days of rain had passed, the roads were bottomless in mud. It was very seriously debated whether the army could be fed where it was, and it was feared, Colonel Walter Taylor has recorded, that it would have to retire to some point nearer the railroad. Time and time again could be seen double teams of horse struggling with six or eight barrels of flour and the axle of the wagon scraping and leveling the roadbed. The wagons could be moved only step by step and then with the greatest difficulty. The epidemic of measles that had first appeared among the survivors of Garnett's ill-starred column spread through the other commands, bringing men down by hundreds and provoking fever and a multitude of intestinal ills. One fine, full regiment of 1,000 North Carolinians was reduced by sickness to one-third its strength before its men ever heard a hostile gun. Half the army was sick and the other wretched half was ignorant of even the rudiments of personal hygiene in the field. The distress of the soldiers aroused Lee's sympathy, but their negligence provoked his indignation. Our poor sick, I know, suffer much, he wrote Mrs. Lee a month later. They bring it on themselves by not doing what they are told. They are worse than children, for the latter can be forced. While Lee continued his reconnoitering in this unhappy atmosphere, Loring slowly brought the rest of his troops forward from his newly established advance base at Huntersville. By August 12 all of them were at Valley Mountain, but until Lee could find a new line of advance they could do nothing against an adversary now fully alive to the danger on his flank and aware that Lee was facing him. General McClellan had been recalled to Washington to take charge of the troops on the Potomac. General W. S. Rosecrans, named as his successor, had placed in direct command on the Cheat Mountain sector an able soldier, whom Lee mentioned as our old friend, J. J. Reynolds of West Point memory, in writing to Mrs. Lee. He is a brigadier general, Lee continued. You may recollect him as the assistant professor of philosophy and lived in the cottage beyond the West Gate with his little, pale-faced wife. He resigned on being relieved from West Point and was made professor of some college in the West. 
Fitzhugh was the bearer of a flag the other day, and he recognized him. He was very polite and made inquiries of us all I am told they feel very safe and are very confident of success. In these circumstances, while the days dragged on as slowly as the wagons in the mud, Lee tried to be cheerful and gave no outward sign of his inward distress. He drew such comfort as he could from the fact that though the Confederates could not advance, they had at least close to the Federals the roads leading to Staunton and to Millborough. The wretchedness of the Green troops grew deeper daily. In the subsequent campaigns of the Army of Northern Virginia, Walter Taylor attested, the troops were subjected to great privations and to many very severe trials, in hunger often, their nakedness scarcely concealed, strength at times almost exhausted, but never did I experience the same heart-sinking emotions as when contemplating the wan faces and the emaciated forms of those hungry, sickly, shivering men of the Army at Valley Mountain. The weather gave no promise of change. Ice formed on the night of August 1415, the soldiers had to huddle around large fires. A Tennessee hog pen would scarcely be more uncomfortable, one weary officer wrote. It rains here all the time, literally, Lee told his wife. There has not been sunshine enough since my arrival to dry my clothes. It is raining now. Has been all day, last night, day before, and day before that, etc., etc but we must be patient. Supplies were brought forward with increasing difficulty. No more than two or three days' food was ever at hand, never enough to make possible even a short advance had the weather permitted. The horses grew thin and pitiful. While reconnoitering daily in the rain and striving to disarm with his diplomacy the jealousy of General Loring, Lee had to guard at long range against a federal advance up the Valley of the Kanawha and had to deal with a continuous controversy between General Floyd and General Wise in that district. He never knew what news of fatal contention the next courier from the South might bring. Nor did he know what the enemy was doing or what Reynolds's numbers were, though every move of the Confederates was quickly reported to the enemy. Disaffection among the militia was as widespread as sickness in the ranks of the volunteers. Still he held tenaciously to the hope of an offensive against the Federals, who had been scattered, as he thought, for the effect their presence might have on the election in western Virginia for the establishment of a loyal state government. The press, all the while, was carrying reports of Lee's movements that would have been amusing in their very naivete if there had not been the painful consciousness of doing so little when the newspapers proclaimed so much. Scarcely had Lee arrived at Valley Mountain before he was reported victorious in a skirmish at Rich Spring. A little later there had been exaggerated accounts, quickly corrected, of heavy losses by General Wise in a withdrawal up the Valley of the Kanawha, coupled with predictions that Lee would soon drive the enemy back or force his capitulation. Ere long Rosecrans was alleged to be surrounded, with every prospect of being compelled to surrender. A little more and Lee was said to have 37,000 men at Gully Bridge, which he had not then visited. The next yarn was that flags of truce had passed between Lee and Rosecrans. The first flag, according to this story, was from GNLR, requiring an evacuation by Lee within 30 days. Lee replied, giving Rosecrans 10 days in which to leave his encampment. From this evidence, we are inclined to think we will soon receive intelligence of a bloody fight at Big Springs. Not to be outdone by the action of the Southern press in reducing Rosecrans's fictitious ultimatum by that days, the wheeling intelligencer soon had perfectly surrounded by our federal troops 10,000 men with four batteries of 28 cannon in all. More than that, he sent in a flag of truce the other day to General Reynolds and offered to surrender all his arms if we would only let him through our lines so that he could go south. He said if we did not accede to his proposition that he would cut his way through. General Reynolds sent back word to cut his way through, as he would never let him out alive, which sounded exceedingly sanguinary for a man who had been assistant professor of philosophy. It was not until September, when furloughed officers began to arrive in Richmond from the Army of the Northwest, that the press abandoned its rodimentate for sober and none too cheerful reports of bad weather and worse roads. Ironically enough, the newspapers grew pessimistic at the very time for things were happening that brought a measure of hope and encouragement to Lee even though the torrential rain still held all operations at a standstill. On August 31 Lee was confirmed as a full general in the regular army of the Confederate States. This had been authorized by Congress on May 16 and Lee had been signing as general, but now the rank was officially conferred. 
On the same day Samuel Cooper, the Adjutant General, Albert Sidney Johnston, Joseph E. Johnston, and P.G.T. Beauregard received like rank. Their commissions were so dated that Cooper and Albert Sidney Johnston were his seniors. Joseph E. Johnston, his former classmate, and Beauregard were rated his juniors, an arrangement that aroused in Johnston a resentment that colored his views throughout the war. Having outranked all the others in the service of the United States, he took it very hard that three of them were his seniors in the Army of the New Republic. Along with the news of his confirmation at the highest grade in Southern service, Lee received a kind letter from General Cooper, assuring him of the President's approval of his conduct of operations and telling him that Davis wished him to return to his former duties as soon as he felt he could leave Western Virginia. It was something, at least, to know that the President understood his difficulties and retained undiminished confidence in him. As a result of Lee's definite promotion, and as a reward of his patient diplomacy, Loring began to show himself more amenable. His jealousy probably remained, but he interposed no objection as Lee gradually took over the strategy of operations. This was a triumph in itself, unrecorded though it was in the damp annals of the little army in the mountains. Things are better organized, Lee wrote in a brief period of sunshine. I feel stronger, we are stronger. Now to drive, the enemy, farther a battle must come off, and I am anxious to begin it. Circumstances beyond human control delay it, I know for good, but I hope the great ruler of the universe will continue to aid and prosper us, and crown at last our feeble efforts with success. The prospect of a successful offensive was the fourth development of early September. Step by step, literally, a route had been found by which a courageous column could make its way from Valley Mountain along the western ridges of Cheat Mountain to a point two miles west of its crest and directly on the road by which the enemy's force on the top of the mountain was being supplied. Before Lee could ascertain precisely how he might fit this discovery into a plan of attack, General Loring sent to him a civilian engineer, whose name unfortunately does not appear in the records, along with Colonel Albert Rust of the 3rd Arkansas Regiment. They had ridden over the mountains to Loring's headquarters from General H. R. Jackson's command and they had information that set every ear tingling, hearing that General Lee was most anxious to find a way of turning the federal position on the top of Cheat Mountain, the engineer had set out from Greenbrier River and, after days of scrambling through thickets and across ravines, had reached a point south of the summit, where the enemy had some trenches and a blockhouse. From this lofty ground, the federal position on the mountain top could be taken. To prove it, the engineer had taken Colonel Rust with him on a second journey to the position he had discovered, and the two, having made what they said was a careful examination, had returned to Jackson without having aroused the enemy's suspicion. Rust explained all this to Lee, and was emphatic in his assertion that a column could reach the point he had visited. The enemy's flank was exposed, he insisted. He had seen it for himself. A surprise attack from the height would give Lee Cheat Mountain and would open the way to a general advance against the enemy, who could not hope to find close at hand another such stronghold. All he asked, Rust confidently went on, was that if General Lee decided to attack, he would give him the privilege of leading the assault on the crest. With his usual amiability, and probably without stopping to weigh the matter, Lee assented to this request. It was to prove a most expensive yes. Many considerations had to be weighed before determining to base a plan of attack on Rust's proposal. The ground was very difficult. Besides the steep abysses, the commanding heights and the absence of roads, there was on the face of Cheat Mountain a dense growth of almost impenetrable laurel that was certain to retard, if not to halt, the surprise attack Rust was so anxious to deliver. The strength of the enemy was unknown. Reynolds was assumed to have about 2,000 men on Cheat Mountain, and his total force there and at Elkwater, which had now been found to be his principal position down Tigert's River, was believed to be at least equal to that of Loring and Jackson. The Confederates had 15,000 or more, but nearly half of these were sick. Reynolds's men were concentrated, those that Lee would have to employ were separated by the Cheat Mountain, and while they would have to attack simultaneously, there was no means of establishing liaison between Jackson and Loring. The store of provisions was so scant that a long offensive could not be sustained. Still, there was the possibility of surprise both on the crest of Cheat Mountain and on the western side of the crest. An offensive seemed practicable if pains were taken to meet every contingency and to deliver the attack on the peak and from both sides of the mountain simultaneously.
and as an alternative to the attempt, what was there except to remain helpless in the wet, windshaken tents on Valley Mountain? Lee decided to fight the battle, his first battle, and he went about his preparations with an eye to every precaution that his judgment could suggest. By September 8, he had worked out the plan to the point where the order could be issued, tactfully in the name of General Loring. It was a good order, detailed, well-drafted, and very simple in form. Rust was secretly to take a column of about 2,000 men to the position he had selected. At the same time, General S. R. Anderson was to move, unobserved by the enemy, along the route Lee had reconnoitered down the western ridge of Cheat Mountain until he reached the road that led to the summit from Tigert's Valley. He was then to occupy the western crest and was to block the road. Jackson, on the eastern side of the mountain, was to take position for a march up the Staunton Parkersburg Turnpike when Rust had cleared it. General Daniel S. Donaldson and Colonel Jesse S. Burks were to be ready to advance down either side of Tigert's River toward Elkwater with Gillum in reserve. Rust was to give the signal by opening fire. When he did so, Jackson was to advance, Anderson was to prevent the dispatch of reinforcements to the stronghold on Cheat Mountain and, if need be, was to support Jackson's attack. Then Anderson was to move down Tigert's Valley. Donaldson and Burks were to pursue, the cavalry was to cover the extreme left. Special instructions were given to keep one column from firing into another. Graphically, the plan of advance was to be approximately as indicated on the opposite page, which, however, does not attempt to give the exact routes of advance. Preparatory to the offensive, Lee issued a supplementary order over his own signature. He had not yet learned the art of writing papers of this sort in the appealing form he later developed, and he was not disposed to emulate his old friend McClellan, whose bombastic imitations of Napoleon's addresses to his army had been ridiculed on every key of southern derision. So Lee followed the traditional style, a style that had not changed greatly since Thucydides had endorsed it as customary more than 2,000 years before. Special Orders No. Headquarters of the Forces Valley Mountain, W., Virginia, September 9, 1861. The forward movement announced to the Army of the Northwest in Special Orders, No. 28, from its headquarters, of this date, gives the general commanding the opportunity of exhorting the troops to keep steadily in view the great principles for which they contend and to manifest to the world their determination to maintain them. The eyes of the country are upon you. The safety of your homes and the lives of all you hold dear depend upon your courage and exertions. Let every man resolve to be victorious, and that the right of self-government, liberty, and peace shall find in him a defender. The progress of this army must be forward. R. E. Lee General The date set for the advance was September 12. Troop movements were to begin on the 9th. As the time approached the weather was quite cold, and the roads, though somewhat better, were still so muddy that wagons sank up to the axles. Gillam and Burks were brought up to the front and seven days' rations were issued to the troops that were to operate on the mountains. At nine o'clock the next morning, September 10, Anderson's brigade started, as it had the longest and most difficult journey to make. The men had no road. In single file, they went through the fields and over steep ridges. It was no uncommon thing, a surgeon wrote, for a mule to slide twenty feet down a slope, and I could see strong men sink exhausted trying to get up the mountainside. The march continued until 10 p.m., when the column was halted and received the usual inhospitable reception of those grim mountains in the form of a hard rain. Meantime, Donaldson had started during the afternoon, as his route was almost as long as Anderson's, though not so uniformly difficult. He was to go down the right bank of the river, then across successive ridges and was at length to descend down Becky Run to the huntersville huttonsville Road, in rear of the Federals, who were believed to be concentrated near Elkwater, about six miles up the river from Huttonsville. Donaldson soon was compelled to leave his artillery behind, and on some stages of this advance his men had to let themselves down steep declivities by holding to the branches of the trees. Back on Valley Mountain that day there came the disquieting news that the supplies of food at Staunton and Millborough were almost exhausted. This was a very serious matter, for it had been a giant's task to accumulate enough bread, meat, and forage for a few days' advance, but Lee was now confident that his plans would bring success, and he did not hesitate because he might encounter a shortage of provisions after the attack was launched.
Lee himself went forward on the 11th with Burks's and Gillam's troops, who were under the personal direction of Loring. At Conrad's Mill, they had a skirmish with a retiring federal outpost, the first action of any sort that Lee saw during the war. This firing was heard up Cheat Mountain by Anderson. His regiments had started early, but the terrain was so difficult that they had to scramble along until 9 p.m., part of the time at the double quick, in order to be within striking distance the next morning. Donaldson had an exciting day for green troops. During the forenoon his advance found fresh tracks along the ridges, showing plainly that a federal column had recently passed down the mountain. Soon Donaldson approached the enemy's pickets, but he easily took the men at the first post, for a number, at the Matthews house, and then he bagged the main picket post, some fifty-six in number, at the Simmons house. Up Becky Run, after nightfall, he came upon another picket post, from which the Federals had fled. His approach, evidently, had been observed and reported, but so far as was known, the Federals were not aware of Anderson's movements. When his men bivouacked, Donaldson reconnoitered and found himself close to still another outpost. The night was cold, but no fires were allowed, and none of the men was permitted to talk above a whisper. His camp was in timber, but on a heavy grade. Here we tried to sleep, Dr. Buist later wrote, but the rain poured so, and the torrents ran down the mountain such a flood of water that we would have drowned had we lain on the ground. As Loring had advanced on the 11th, dawn of September 12th found Lee where he had every reason to hope for success. The men were hungry, for their rations had been spoiled by the rain. Their muskets were dripping. All were weary. But Anderson was where he could reach the Staunton Parkersburg Pike in a rush, Donaldson occupied a position whence he could reinforce either Loring or Anderson. The troops that had marched down the valley under General Loring were close to the enemy. If Rust and Jackson were doing their part of the grim work on the eastern side of Cheat Mountain, that barrier might easily be seized and the enemy driven down Tigert's Valley. The rain of the night had given place to a fog, and now this lifted, as if an augury. From the eminence where he had taken his stand, Lee could look down the valley and could glimpse the tents of the nearest federal encampment, a tempting sight, he termed it. The soldiers, all expectant, withdrew the charges from their wet muskets and began to clean their arms and to reload with what dry powder could be found. It was a slow task, and it might be interrupted at any minute by the rolling echoes of Rust's triumphant fire. The attack was to open when a volley from the crest of Cheat Mountain announced that Rust was storming the blockhouse and the trenches there. What was delaying the confident colonel? It was long past light, eight o'clock in fact, and not a sound had come from the summit. Had Rust lost his way? Lee began to ask himself the question, and the minutes passed without an answer. Now a courier reported that Anderson's men were across the Cheat Mountain Road and had cut communication between the summit and the Huntersville-Huttonsville Road. The federal pickets had been driven in, with the loss of a few men in Anderson's command. The movement would soon be known to every regiment in the valley, was Rust never going to give the signal? Presently the expectant silence was shattered by the sound of guns. But it was not a volley. It was more like random firing. And it came from the wrong direction, not from Cheat Mountain, but from up Becky Run. What was afoot there? Lee spurred down the ridge, to find out, and made for the main road, which lay on the other side of a wood in the valley. Just as he was about to emerge there was a clanging of sabers, the sharp staccato of horses' hoofs in full career, and a strong federal cavalry outpost dashed by in the direction of the firing. Lee was within the enemy's position. Before he could decide what to do, there were shouts, bugle calls, more firing, and the Federals came back the way they had come. They had run into Donaldson's pickets and were carrying back the news of his advance. Not one man in the roaring column observed the little group of grey-clad horsemen in the woods. When the Federals had vanished down the muddy road, Lee went into Donaldson's lines and learned, to his chagrin, that the firing had been done by impatient soldiers who hoped in this way to clean their guns more quickly. It did not matter greatly, perhaps. The alarm had been given and the enemy was on the alert by now, for ten o'clock had come and passed. Something manifestly had gone wrong with rust. He had to be counted out of the action he was to open. What could be done to reshape the plan to this disheartening development?
nothing, manifestly, except to give battle with the troops west of the mountain, regardless of Rust and of Jackson. Quickly Lee undertook to put the brigades into position to do this. He rode in person to Donelson and directed him to descend into the valley. Anderson he ordered to retire from his exposed position. There was much galloping about and vast confusion. Lee went from regiment to regiment, urging the colonels to get their men in hand. Donelson succeeded to the extent of forcing a small picket across a swollen run where he captured a few more prisoners. Elsewhere, Lee encountered a curious and invincible passive resistance among the officers. The men were wet and too hungry, he was told, to undertake a battle. Loring could not get into position without crossing the river and it was too high for fording. Morale was gone. Everywhere there was an excuse, nowhere any zeal for the conflict. By noon it was apparent that nothing could be accomplished. All the high expectations of the morning had evaporated. Lee's elaborate plan could not be executed in any essential. His first battle had ended in utter fiasco. Not one word did Lee receive from Rust or from Jackson the whole day to explain why the attack on the crest of Cheat Mountain had not been delivered. The morning of September 13 brought no report. As the men had now rested somewhat, Lee determined to see if he could not hold his position in Tigert's Valley and on the ridges and find a new way of reaching the rear of the Federals. It was futile, of course, to attempt anything further on Cheat Mountain, but west of the river, in the direction of Rich Mountain, a turning movement might be possible. Reconnoitering parties were sent out, and Gillam's brigade was put to work cutting a road along the ridge. As a part of the reconnaissance, Colonel Washington and Rooney Lee, with a few men, decided to explore the right branch of Elkwater Fork and duly set out. Late in the afternoon Rooney returned with the sad news that they had suddenly encountered a federal picket and had been fired upon. Colonel Washington had fallen at the first fusillade and his body had not been recovered. Lee's grief was instant and apparent, for he esteemed Washington both as a friend and as a gentleman. This was the only incident of consequence during the day, though it is possible that the Confederates in the valley heard some sounds of firing as the Federal garrison on the summit of Cheat Mountain made a demonstration against Jackson's outposts on the other side of the ridge. On the 14th, Lee sent a flag of truce to the Federals, with a message requesting the body of Colonel Washington, if dead, or news of him, if captured. On the way the bearers of the flag were met by a party of Federals bringing the remains of the unfortunate officer. In deep personal grief, Lee wrote the first of many letters he was doomed to address to those who lost friends known intimately to him in the army. Camp on Valley River September 16, 1861 My dear Miss Louisa, With a heart filled with grief, I have to communicate the saddest tidings you have ever heard. May our Father, who is in heaven, enable you to bear it, for in his inscrutable providence, abounding in mercy and omnipotent in power, he has made you fatherless on earth. Your dear Father, in reconnoitering the enemy's position, came into the range of fire of his pickets and was instantly killed. He fell in the cause to which he had devoted all his energies and in which his noble heart was warmly enlisted. My intimate association with him for some months has more fully disclosed to me his great worth than double so many years of ordinary intercourse would have been sufficient to reveal. We have shared the same tent, and morning and evening has his earnest devotion to Almighty God elicited my grateful admiration. He is now safely in heaven, I trust with her he so loved on earth. We ought not to wish him back. May God, in his mercy, my dear child, sustain you, your sisters and brothers, under this heavy affliction. My own grief is so great, I will not afflict you further with it. Faithfully your friend. R. E. Lee. Miss Louisa Washington. Before this letter was penned, Lee learned, through Loring, what had happened east of Cheat Mountain. The information came in the form of a curious and confused report from Rust. His column, it developed, had safely reached the designated position on the morning of September 12, unobserved by the enemy. At the head of his men, Rustin Person had captured the first of several pickets who were silently disarmed. These prisoners were costly, however, and served their cause far better with their tongues than with their muskets. They imposed upon the gullible Rust most amazingly.
they told him that there were forty hundred to fifty hundred men on Cheat Mountain, that they were strongly fortified, that they knew of his approach, and that they had already telegraphed for reinforcements. After questioning the men, Russ concluded that their capture was nothing short of a providential warning against making the assault, and he looked out on the enemy's position with very different eyes from those he had hopefully turned on it when he had made his reconnaissance. He saw a fort or blockhouse on the point or elbow of the road, he reported, entrenchments on the south, and outside the entrenchments and all around up the road heavy and impassable abatis, if the enemy were behind them. We got near enough to see the enemy in the trenches beyond the abatis. I knew the enemy had four times my force, but for the abatis we would have made the assault. We could not get to them to make it. That was all. Russ simply waited, without firing a gun, and then withdrew as he had come, after he had incautiously let the enemy become aware of his presence. Russ did not know, and it is likely he never learned that instead of forty hundred to fifty hundred men, a force for times, his, strength, as he reported, the troops on the crest had numbered only three hundred. Not only so, but their attention had been diverted, at the time Rust was watching them, by the news that the road leading from Elkwater had been cut by Anderson. At the very time this disheartening news reached him, it became apparent to Lee that nothing could be accomplished on the west side of Tigert's Valley. The enemy was too much on the alert, the terrain was too tangled. Supplies were exhausted, and the line of communications via Huntersville, Valley Mountain, and the Huttonsville Road was too long and difficult. There was nothing for Lee to do except to order the columns back to Valley Mountain, with absolutely no positive result for all his planning. Well, said one indignant Tennessean, at the end of seven days marching and starvation, we got back to Valley Mountain, the whole affair having proved a failure, in the opinion of our brigade, chiefly from the old fogeyism and one of pluck among the Virginians. Never were men more sick of Virginia and Virginians than we are. Lee's disappointment was profound. Despite a determination not to be influenced one way or another, by an uninformed press, his chagrin must have been sharpened by the comments of the newspapers. When news had first come that Rosecrans had detached troops from in front of Lee and was marching on Floyd, there had been some mild murmurings and some complaints, not directed against Lee, over what the editors regarded as a poor disposition of the Confederate troops on the two possible lines of advance. These misgivings were expressed along with hopes of a great victory. Then, after the first disconcerting news had been received and the difficulties that had been encountered by Lee had been explained, there came absurd rumors of a great triumph, culminating in the capture of General Reynolds. The Richmond Inquirer, the most powerful paper in the Confederate capital, was so confident of the outcome that it indited a laudatory editorial which concluded with the assertion that if Lee should force the enemy to surrender without a blow, it will stand a monument to his fame of which any professor of the military art, however gifted or fortunate, might well be proud. Meantime, in the gossip over a successor to L. Pope Walker, who had resigned as Secretary of War, Lee's name was put forward by admirers. It was bad enough to have failed, it was worse to have failure presented as victory and to be lauded for it. Lee attributed the outcome to the reign and to the will of God. He had long believed in a daily providence directing the acts of man for man's own good, and now that he saw great designs balanced on a beam that a featherweight of unforeseen circumstances might tip, he recognized the hand of the Almighty in every happening and found solace in the belief that God had ordered best. His fullest statement regarding the abortive action was given in a letter to Governor Letcher, who had addressed him in terms of high confidence not long before the movement against Cheat Mountain began. Lee's reply explained his hopes and, at the same time, exhibited the temper in which he was to accept throughout the war the reverses that came to him. It is the first of a score of singular letters that Lee was to write, in varying conditions, during and after the war, to a number of individuals who made inquiries he felt constrained to answer. All these letters are penned in the same spirit, characteristic of Lee the soldier. They are candid and yet reserved, they explain but they do not clarify. Sometimes they are so difficult to interpret that one gets the impression that Lee was deliberately reticent to the point of leaving the essential facts obscured. More than once, where he makes it plain that he is not himself responsible for failure, he consistently refuses to put the blame on those who acted under his orders. For these reasons his letter to Governor Letcher deserves to be quoted in full. Valley Mountain, September 17, 1861
My dear Governor, I received your very kind note of the fifth instant, just as I was about to accompany General Loring's command on an expedition to the enemy's works in front, or I would have before thanked you for the interest you take in my welfare and your flattering expressions of my ability. Indeed, you overrate me much, and I feel humbled when I weigh myself by your standard. I am, however, very grateful for your confidence, and I can answer for my sincerity in the earnest endeavor I make to advance the cause I have so much at heart, though conscious of the slow progress I make. I was very sanguine of taking the enemy's works on last Thursday morning. I had considered the subject well. With great effort the troops intended for the surprise had reached their destination, having traversed twenty miles of steep, rugged mountain paths, and the last day through a terrible storm, which lasted all night, and in which they had to stand drenched to the skin in cold rain. Still, their spirits were good. When morning broke, I could see the enemy's tents on Valley River, at the point on the Huttonsville Road, just below me. It was a tempting sight. We waited for the attack on Cheat Mountain, which was to be the signal. Till 10 a.m., the men were cleaning their unserviceable arms. But the signal did not come. All chance for a surprise was gone. The provisions of the men had been destroyed the previous day by the storm. They had nothing to eat that morning, could not hold out another day, and were obliged to be withdrawn. The party sent to Cheat Mountain to take that in rear had also to be withdrawn. The attack to come off from the east side failed from the difficulties in the way, the opportunity was lost, and our plan discovered. It is a grievous disappointment to me, I assure you. But for the rainstorm, I have no doubt it would have succeeded. This, Governor, is for your own eye. Please do not speak of it, we must try again. Our greatest loss is the death of my dear friend, Colonel Washington. Out loss was small besides what I have mentioned. Our greatest difficulty is the roads. It has been raining in these mountains for about six weeks. It is impossible to get along. It is that which has paralyzed all our efforts. With sincere thanks for your good wishes, I am very truly yours. R. E. Lee. His Excellency, Governor John Letcher. We must try again, he said, but what was left to try? The enemy could not advance. From that fact Lee took such comfort as he might, philosophically affirming that the offensive had left affairs much as they had been, with the routes to the railroad closed. But if the enemy could not advance, neither could Lee. There were no more byways to be followed to the enemy's rear. Every trail was guarded. It was useless to continue to keep on that front more troops than were required to hold the passes. Especially was it wasteful to camp a large force there when Rosecrans was advancing up the valley of the Kanawha against Generals Wise and Floyd, with troops withdrawn from the northern sector. So, three days after he wrote Governor Letcher, Lee struck his tent on Valley Mountain of unhappy memory, ordered Loring to follow him with most of his forces, and started for the headwaters of the Kanawha. His first campaign had ended ingloriously. He had not been able to hold a foot of ground in advance of the positions occupied by the troops when he arrived. Everything had been against him, to be sure, weather, sickness, and circumstance. It is very doubtful whether any soldier could have succeeded in such weather. The larger opportunities had been lost before he came. Cheat Mountain had been occupied. The Federals in front of Valley Mountain were being strengthened by the time he reached that position. Loring had been a most difficult person with whom to deal. Rust's conduct on the 12th had been inexcusable. When all these considerations are given their full weight, Lee's own performance in at least four respects must be adjudged disappointing. The first, already discussed in sufficient detail, was his failure to push Loring forward from Huntersville when, on August 3, he reached that village. The weakness that led Lee to wait on Loring was more than a temporary obstacle to success. It was a threat to his future as a soldier. Lee's conduct of his first campaign is to be criticized, in the second place, because he consented to let Rust lead the attack against a position that no trained soldier had reconnoitered. Rust had superb troops, they were to prove that in a desperate hour at Sharpsburg, and Rust himself was no coward. He was a thoroughly devoted man, filled with state pride and southern zeal, but he was a politician, a former member of Congress, with no military experience whatever before 1861. 
Unacquainted with the whole art of reconnaissance, his report of the situation on Cheat Summit should not have gone unchecked. He deserved commendation for having followed the nameless engineer to the crest, but it was a most serious mistake to reward him by entrusting to him the most delicately difficult part of the whole operation. The task called for a trained soldier, not for an unskilled volunteer who, until that day, had never been in action. Yet because Rust was confident the redoubt could be carried, and because he asked the honor of leading the attack, Lee had consented. If he did not weigh the personal factor, he was blamable, if his amiability overrode his judgment, he was no less censurable. The third question that must be asked regarding Lee's conduct of his first campaign is whether he should have overridden the objections of the officers who told him during the forenoon of the 12th that their men were in no condition to deliver an attack after Rust failed to surprise the garrison on the mountain top. This may or may not be a valid ground of criticism. Certain it is that in 1863 or in 1864 Lee's officers would not have dared to raise such an objection, and he would not have heeded them if they had. In 1861 it may have been different. The evidence concerning what actually happened is so scanty that no final judgment can be based on it. Lee's plan for the unfought battle was very elaborate. Five columns were to operate separately and were to attack in specified order on a given signal. Thanks to the extraordinary efforts Lee made with the four small brigades west of the mountains, they were in position to attack on time. So was H. R. Jackson, who had a very short distance to go. Only Rust's change of mind prevented the execution of the plan as Lee had drawn it up. But if the plan had not called for Rust to give the signal, it might have involved some other move equally apt to be upset by unforeseen happenings. In short, the plan of action suggested that Lee was disposed to be over-elaborate in his strategy to attempt too much with the tools he had. Despite hourly warnings and daily disillusionment, he had not yet learned the difference between 1847 and 1861, the difference between the standard of performance of a skilled and of an unskilled staff. The contemporary criticism of the campaign was more general. It was that Lee was too much of a theorist and that he had been overcautious. The press that had praised him now turned upon him. The Richmond Examiner, which was the harshest critic of the Davis administration, reported that Lee had forwarded to the War Department a plan for the action of September 12, adorned with drawings and said by military men to have been one of the most perfect pieces of strategy in the entire campaign. But, the paper added with a shade of satire, as, the plan, has been disappointed, it will be useless to canvass its merits. The Richmond Dispatch dwelt on Lee's too great circumspection and warned him that in mountain warfare, the learning of the books and of the strategists is of little value. It went on, in a country where it is impossible to find enough level land to muster a company of militia, there is very little scope for ingeniously studied military evolutions or consummately arranged plans of campaign on paper. But Lee had learned much. His excessive consideration for the feelings of others he was not speedily to overcome. Until after the Battle of Fraser's Farm, he was to employ a strategy much too magnificent. Some of his other mistakes he was never again to repeat. On the positive side, this campaign and the one that was to follow in the Valley of the Kanaw disclosed in his dealings with the man in the ranks the aptitude and the understanding that later made it possible for him to build the superb morale of the Army of Northern Virginia. Numerous instances of this occurred on the rain-wrapped mountains. Dressed simply in an improvised uniform, with a fatigue cap and jacket, he was constantly among the men. Soon he grew a beard, after the military fashion of the time, and as this was grey, it gave him a paternal, not to say a patriarchal look in the eyes of his youthful troops. His manner comported with his appearance. Once when a soldier was charged with sleeping on sentry post and pleaded that he had merely sat down and had not heard the approach of the officer because the softness of the ground had deadened the sound of his footsteps, it was Lee who urged leniency. When he saw men drinking from a spring where the horses were watered, he insisted that they use another spring near his quarters. As he was making a reconnaissance near a picket post and found the soldiers crowding about him curiously, he turned mildly on the most inquisitive of them. What regiment do you belong to? he asked the man. First Tennessee, Maury Grays, said the soldier, Walter Akin, by name. Are you well drilled? Yes, indeed, the proud private answered. Take the position of a soldier. Akin did so. Forward, march, said Lee. 
by the right flank, march. When Akin's solitary movements headed him for his camp, Lee added, double quick, march. Akin understood, so did his comrades. Lee was troubled no more that day. Perhaps the most amusing episode of all came on a later reconnaissance. Lee was busy with his field glasses, studying a distant position, when a soldier of the 16-H North Carolina Infantry came up to him. Lee made it a rule from the first, at all times and in any circumstances, to hear the requests and complaints of soldiers who sought him out, and he obligingly dropped his glasses and spoke to the man, what did he desire? Unabashed, the soldier asked if the general could let him have a chew of tobacco, as his supply was out. Lee treated the request as if were one properly to be made by a lover of the quid, and as he never used or carried tobacco, he referred the Carolinian to a staff officer, who promptly obliged him. These were small incidents, but they created in the minds of the men a feeling that General Lee understood them, sympathized with them, and was mindful of their wants. Lee was prompted, of course, by his simple interest in his fellow men, and as he rode unhappily away from Valley Mountain, where some of his officers so signally had failed him, he did not realize that he was creating among the men in the ranks a spirit that in many a bitter hour was to redeem the mistakes of other officers. Chapter 34, Politics and War, A Sorry Story Henry A. Hawes, governor of Virginia at the time of John Brown Raid, had dreamed in 1861 of organizing an independent partisan command, subject only to the general laws and orders of the service, but when the disaffection of Western Virginia became apparent, just before Garnett was sent to the Alleghenies, Wise was summoned to Richmond by President Davis, was given a commission as a brigadier general, and was hurried off to the Valley of the Kanawha. He had been the champion of the interests of that section in the great battle over representation in the Virginia Convention of 1850-1851, and it was believed that his presence in that quarter, as the spokesman of Southern rights, would rally the wavering. With only a few untrained staff officers and a handful of troops from eastern Virginia, he went into the disputed territory early in June. By eloquence and personal appeals, he contrived to raise his force during the next seven weeks to some 2,850 men, infantry, cavalry, and artillery, whom he organized as a legion and mustered into the Confederate service. Simultaneously, 1,800 state volunteers were enlisted or brought from nearby counties to cooperate with him. Most of these men were wretchedly equipped and many of the state volunteers considered that they had entered the ranks solely to protect their own homes against invaders. Undependable as was this force, and inexperienced as were the commander and most of his officers, Wise advanced boldly down the valley of the Kanawha to Charleston. Every step, he subsequently reported, was amid the rattlesnakes of treason to the south or petty serpents of jealousy in the disaffection of my own camp. He went so far that first Adjutant General Cooper and then General Lee had to warn him of the danger of being cut off. On July 17 Wise had a successful brush with a federal force at Scary Creek, near Charleston, but a week later he began to fall back in the face of what he believed to be great odds. As some of the state volunteers passed the homes they had enlisted to defend, they began to drop out of ranks until nearly 500 of them had disappeared. The rest of the command held together until it halted, about August 3rd, ragged and exhausted, to refit at White Sulphur Springs, beyond the reach of the enemy. It had been an unhappy venture, far less the fault of Wise, who had done his best, than of the administration, which had entirely misjudged conditions in the Kanawha Valley. Wise lost none of his confidence or ambition because of this campaign. Regarding his legion as essentially an independent command, he cherished hopes of faring forth again, as soon as his men were rested and freshly equipped, to fight new battles and win new laurels. His lack of technical knowledge of war did not deter him in the slightest. While Wise was in the Kanawha Valley, Brigadier General John B. Floyd was completing the enlistment of the Brigade of Riflemen that President Davis had imprudently authorized him to raise, to the great impairment of regular recruiting in southwest Virginia, where Floyd resided. Floyd was as ambitious as wise. He had been a lawyer, a politician, a member of the Virginia legislature, and, like wise, governor of Virginia. Serving as Secretary of War during most of Buchanan's administration, he had been accused of favoring the South by scattering the regular army and by piling up arms of late models in federal arsenals located in the disaffected states. A darker charge, inspired by politics, of abstracting government bonds, he had, in January, 1861, successfully met.
Floyd was not altogether devoid of native military talent. He possessed no little energy and a world of self-reliance, but he was rash and was to disclose a temperament readily confused in action. While Wise hoped to fire the imagination of the country by leading a partisan corps, Floyd believed his immediate destiny was to carry the war triumphantly down the Kanawha Valley and into Ohio. His troops, on the whole, were much better equipped than those of General Wise, but they lacked good muskets, artillery, and cavalry. Just at the time Wise was retreating from the Kanawha Valley, Floyd was sending the last of his troops to the western terminus of the Virginia Central Railroad. Floyd himself soon followed his men, prepared for glory and well-equipped for publicity, with not less than three newspaper editors on his staff. He was satisfied that Wise's forces had made a failure of their campaign, though, he wrote, they will not allow it to be a retreat, and he was equally sure that he could redeem the evil hour. We will, said he, have stirring work in the West, before a great while, I think. On August 6, at White Sulphur Springs, the two ex-governors met for their first council of war. Each came in the memory of ancient political differences, each in a determination to yield nothing to the other. Floyd was the senior and was intent on asserting his authority over his rival. Wise was resolved, at any cost, to retain the independence of his command, with which he claimed the president had vested him. The two clashed as soon as they began consultation. Floyd was anxious for Wise to move forward in cooperation with the advance he was about to make in the direction of the Kanawha Valley, Wise immediately protested that his tired soldiers would require at least a fortnight in which to refit. The two parted without a final decision. Foreseeing what was certain to follow, Wise appealed to General Lee to separate his command from Floyd's, but Lee was apprehensive of a federal advance against the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad, and as he could not afford to divide the few regiments covering that line, he rejected Wise's appeal and directed Floyd to assume command of all the troops in that territory unless he had orders to the contrary from Richmond. Floyd had already renewed his call on Wise to advance, without budging him from White's sulfur, and he promptly availed himself of his new authority from Lee to issue an order assuming command of all the forces intended to operate in the Kanawha Valley. About that time, word came that the Federals were advancing and were threatening one of the Confederate outposts. Floyd was a bit confused and somewhat self-contradictory in his interpretation of reports of the strength and position of the enemy, but he determined to push forward and directed Wise to send one of his regiments to move with his column. Once more Wise protested, explaining that his men were unready and arguing that his superior's advance was ill-timed. Immediately there was hot contention, new orders from Floyd for Wise to put all his troops in the road, a fresh appeal from Wise to Lee for the separation of his command from Floyd, a vain effort on Lee's part to smooth out the differences, then peremptory orders from Floyd to Wise and grumbling obedience by Wise, who started at length with all except two of his regiments. Lee sided with Wise as to the policy of a general advance, but he could not sustain him, of course, in his defiant insubordination. The quarrel was already past mending. Wise was satisfied, as he subsequently wrote President Davis, that General Floyd's design was to destroy my command and not only transfer to himself the state troops and militia, but by constant detachments of my legion, to merge it also in his brigade, to be commanded by his field officers, and be torn to pieces by maladministration, and to sink me, the second in command, even below his majors and captains. Floyd proceeded to take the state troops entirely from under Wise's control, regardless of the general's wrathful protests. In apprising the president of what he deemed to be Wise's failure to cooperate, he showed no disposition to compromise or to conciliate. I know perfectly well how to enforce obedience, he wrote, and will, without the least hesitation, do it. Again there was an appeal by Wise to Lee for a transfer, again Lee had to sustain Floyd and had to explain to Wise that the army of the Kanawha was too small to be divided. In much contention and excitement, Floyd moved forward after the middle of August to the vicinity of Carnifex Ferry, on the Gauley River. Wise unwillingly followed, his men as dissatisfied as he. Two of his regiments lost half their personnel on the road, through desertion and measles. On August 25, when the cavalry who were covering his advance broke and fled, Wise was forced to halt temporarily. The next day, by a vigorous move, Floyd surprised the 7th Ohio at Cross Lanes and, without any assistance from Wise, routed it and captured many of its men. This initial victory of his career greatly increased Floyd's self-confidence and indirectly led to new friction between him and Wise, who once again renewed his request to be detached.
Floyd countered by offering to trade Wise's legion any takers in return for three regiments of infantry. There followed a brief season of alarms and rumors when Floyd had to put aside his dream of an advance to the Ohio and had, instead, to call up reinforcements in great haste. Disgusted by what he termed Floyd's vacillating and harassing orders, Wise made a successful demonstration on his own account though his command was still at half its strength because of sickness. This brush solved Wise's pride and served momentarily to offset Floyd's victory at cross lanes. Floyd wrote little about all this to Lee, electing to correspond directly with President Davis. His rival regarded Lee as his defender and rarely indited one of his wrathful notes to Floyd without justifying himself in a letter to Lee. Lee's missives and the condition they disclosed in the upper valley of the Kana had added no little to Lee's troubles in the gloom of his mountain camp, but until the second week in September the situation on the scene of the wise Floyd war was not alarming. In fact, Floyd's success at cross lanes had suggested to Lee a plan by which Floyd might exploit his advantage and perhaps cut communications between the Federals on the northern and southern sectors. On September 8, however, a new danger developed. Floyd's principal adversary until that time had been Brigadier General Jacob D. Cox, who had been based on the Canoe River. Now Lee learned that General Rosecrans was preparing to reinforce Cox heavily with troops sent southward from the Huntersville Elk Water Sector. Floyd at that time was on the northern bank of Gully River, at Carnifex Ferry, with Wise at Hawk's Nest, 12 miles southwest of the ferry, guarding Floyd's flank and rear from a drive up the Kanawha Valley. Lee at once saw that Floyd might be caught between two attacks or overwhelmed from the north. He accordingly warned him to be on the alert against a thrust southward by Rosecrans and advised him to withdraw across the gully in case he did not feel strong enough to fight with his back to the river. Floyd did not see fit to take this advice, but remained where he was, writing alternately of being cut to pieces by superior forces and of advancing to the Ohio and laying waste the federal shore. On the night of September 8-9, Floyd received positive news of an advance by a force moving down from the north, and he forthwith called on Wise for one regiment of the state volunteers and one from Wise's legion. Wise sent the state troops, but protested hotly against the dispatch of any part of his own small command, on the ground that he was in danger of being attacked by General Cox. A sulfurious exchange was precipitated, in which Wise argued the unwisdom of the course Floyd proposed to follow in meeting the enemy north of the Gully River. In the midst of this correspondence Wise found space to carry on a quarrel that had been started the previous day by an allegation on Floyd's part that one of Wise's officers had taken a field gun intended for Floyd. The conclusion of the crossfire over the dispatch of part of Wise's legion was a flat announcement by Wise that he would exercise his military discretion and decline to send the troops. Before Floyd could answer with a new order, he was attacked, on the afternoon of September 10, by Rosecrans at Carnifex Ferry. He beat off several assaults, but considered the force in his front overwhelming and fell back during the night to the south bank of the river, whence he again ordered Wise to reinforce him. This time Wise obeyed, but ere his men reached Floyd they were told to return, as Floyd was retreating farther to the eastward. Floyd was quick to explain to headquarters that he had less than 2,000 men in action and that he would certainly have been victorious if Wise had sent up the regiment he had required and if fresh troops on the road to him had arrived in time. His retreat across the river, he told the Secretary of War, was in accordance with Lee's orders. He apparently did not think it necessary to add that Lee's recommendation, it was not an order, had been for a withdrawal in case he was threatened, without risking a fight where he might be driven into the stream. Wise, for his part, anticipated all criticism of his course by saying, I solemnly protest that my force is not safe under his, Floyd's, command. Floyd had been slightly wounded at Carnifex Ferry and for a time was almost bewildered. On the 11th, when Wise met him, he was so little the master of himself that he admitted in the presence of his rival he did not know what orders to give. The next day he had somewhat recovered his composure, and as the country to the southeast of them was a rugged wilderness that would not sustain his little army, he decided to continue his retreat to Big Sewell Mountain, a distance of something over 20 miles. Wise preceded him, under orders, and halted, at length, on an eminence close to Sewell Creek, near the present post office of Maywood, within a mile of the boundary between Fayette and Greenbrier counties. Floyd drew up his column a mile and a half west of Wise, on the crest of Sewell Mountain. On the late afternoon of the 16th he held a council of war, to which he invited Wise and such of his officers as Wise saw fit to bring.
Up to this point on the retreat he and Wise had staged three distinct controversies, one over Wise's inability to supply Floyd with a cavalry scout, the second over five wagons that Floyd had borrowed from Wise, and the third over fifty-four of Wise's sabers that Floyd's officers were alleged to have taken. At the council, however, nothing was said of this unpleasantness. Everything began amicably. And as Floyd seemed to have no definite plan, Wise proceeded to tell his superior what should be done. Neither he nor Floyd had any definite information as to the strength or position of the enemy, who was supposed to be approaching in two columns, Cox from the west and Rosecrans from the northwest. Wise was satisfied that he had chosen the stronger position and that Floyd held the weaker, and he argued vigorously for a concentration on the high ground his troops then occupied. When Floyd apparently acquiesced, Wise pushed his advantage and asked that certain new troops be incorporated in his command. The council ended with Wise seemingly in control of the situation. But as Wise left Floyd's camp one of his officers called his attention to activity among the troops, and he had hardly reached his own post before Floyd's column began to pass through, bound across Sewell Creek, on the road toward Lewisburg. Soon there came a dispatch from Floyd, announcing that he had decided to fall back beyond Sewell Mountain to the vicinity of Meadow Bluff, twelve miles away. Wise was instructed to hold himself in readiness to cover the rear. This was too much for Wise. Outraged at Floyd's change of mind and incensed that his own plan had been rejected, he calmly remained where he was in an answer to repeated inquiries and orders from Floyd contended that he could better cooperate with Floyd and could more readily repulse the enemy where he was than at Meadow Bluff, which was only 16 miles west of Lewisburg. Privately, he intimated to his officers that he would stay where he was in fight, orders or no orders. Very soon the enemy appeared in strength and took the position Floyd had evacuated. Wise had not more than 2,200 men and faced at least twice that number. The road between him and Floyd was steep and difficult, crossing many small streams in its 12 miles and liable to be rendered impassable by rains. Friction, rival ambitions, and military insubordination had reached their climax. Wise seemed in danger of being cut to pieces before Floyd could reinforce him. Thus matters stood on September 21st when General Lee, accompanied only by Taylor and a small cavalry escort, drew rein in Floyd's camp at Meadow Bluff. Chapter 35, Politics, the Rain Demon, and Another Failure The course that Lee from the outset had urged on the senior of the rivals in the Kanawha Valley was simple, Floyd was to advance if he could but was to secure his rear against attack and was not to take any chances whereby the enemy would reach the railroads. As Lee had approached the scene, he had been informed of the imminence of an attack and had directed Floyd to concentrate and fortify in the strongest position west of Lewisburg. Finding on his arrival that Wise had not united with Floyd and that the army had thus far escaped battle, his first determination was, of course, to bring all the troops together. Loring had been ordered to follow Lee to the Kanawha Valley. When he arrived with his troops the Confederates would be strong enough to combat the Federals. Until that time division might mean disaster. So Lee reasoned. The strain of Valley Mountain, the weariness produced by his long, hurried ride, and his apprehension of a Union attack on scattered forces combined to make him write to Wise, soon after his arrival at Meadow Bluff, a letter that displays a curious touch of heroics. He said, I know nothing of the relative advantages of the points occupied by yourself and General Floyd, but as far as I can judge our united forces are not more than one half the strength of the enemy. Together, they may not be able to stand the assault. It would be the height of imprudence to submit them separately to his attack. I beg, therefore, if not too late, that the troops be united, and that we conquer or die together. You have spoken to me of one of consultation and concert, let that pass till the enemy is driven back, and then, as far as I can, all shall be arranged. I expect this of your magnanimity. Consult that and the interest of our cause, and all will go well. Lee's argument did not shake Wise's conviction that he had chosen the better of the two positions. It was his contention, moreover, that for all practical purposes he was united with Floyd. But he had high respect for Lee and apparently was not a little amused at the unwanted rhetoric of Lee's appeal. In answer, he explained at length the advantage of his ground and bade Lee, just say, where we are to unite and conquer or die together. Meantime, Lee or no Lee, he held on to the heights in the face of the approach of Rosecrans' army. The situation called for action. The following day, 
the 22D, Lee rode forward to Sewell Mountain and made a reconnaissance. The position was naturally as strong as Wise had affirmed. It was stronger, in fact, than that of Floyd, 12 miles to the rear. If the main attack was to be directed along the line of the James River and the Connaught Turnpike, across Sewell Mountain, then it was the course of wisdom to bring up Floyd and to fight where Wise stood. There was but one military argument on the other side, north and south of Wise ran a few inferior roads by which a vigorous enemy might flank his position, cut him off from Floyd, then wipe out both. The reports from the cavalry outposts were not detailed enough to tell whether the enemy was preparing a frontal attack or a flanking movement by these roads. In this uncertainty, Lee left Wise without making a decision or explicitly ordering him to retreat. On Lee's return to Floyd he found that officer more satisfied than ever that the Federals were outflanking Wise and were moving against him. Floyd, however, had no tangible evidence of this. Consequently, Lee determined to await the development of the enemy's plans. The next morning word came from Wise that the Federals were preparing to attack him and that he could not withdraw. As Floyd still insisted that the enemy was moving around Wise's position, Lee again urged Wise to unite with Floyd if possible and, in any case, to send back his wagon train and prepare for a quick retreat on the first evidence of a move against Floyd. On the receipt of this letter, Wise, who had indulged in some heroics of his own earlier in the day, replied that the enemy in his front was not so strong as he had thought. His statements as to the position of the enemy were contradictory and made the situation more involved than ever. The absence of any large force in front of Wise might mean that the Unionists were turning his flank, but, on the other hand, the lack of positive information of any federal movement on either side of Wise's position might indicate that the whole Northern Army was facing Wise on the mountain though only a part of it was visible. It was a very close question. Once more Lee had to warn Wise of the risks he was taking by remaining in his exposed position, but, at the same time, he had to assume that Wise had correctly stated the case when he said he could not draw away from the enemy without disaster. Lee concluded that the reinforcement of Wise with a part of Floyd's men might make him strong enough to beat off the enemy even if the whole force were in his front. A moderate reduction of Floyd's army might not weaken him past resistance before Loring came up, if it should develop that the Federals, after all, were operating around Wise's flank. It was dangerous, of course, to keep the forces divided, but if they must be divided they could be equalized. On September 24, therefore, Lee started for Wise's position and had four of Floyd's regiments brought up at once to his support. When Lee arrived at Sewell Mountain, in no good humor, he found the enemy in sight, a mile and a half from Wise, on the crest that Floyd had first occupied on his withdrawal from Carnifex Ferry. Whether it was Cox or Rosecrantz, or both, Lee could not tell, but he had time to look around and to direct a more thorough reconnaissance. The whole of his experience in Western Virginia had been a satire on everything he had learned about war, but here, in the very face of the enemy, conditions were worse than any he had yet encountered. Wise's sick troops were wretched and without shelter. Many of the officers were discontented, ignorant of their duties, and bitter toward Floyd and his command. Disorganization and demoralization were widespread. While Lee was examining the situation he was approached by the youthful lieutenant of a command that had been on Sewell Mountain for some days. This officer calmly asked Lee to tell him who his ordnance officer was and where he could find the ordnance depot. Long-taxed patience snapped. Lee eyed him sternly. I think it very strange, Lieutenant, he said, that an officer of this command, which has been here a week, should come to me, who am just arrived, and ask who his ordnance officer is and where to find his ammunition. This is in keeping with everything else I find here, no order, no organization, nobody knows where anything is, no one understands his duty. And amid this military chaos, like a stubborn old seneschal in the last hour of a hopeless siege, General Wise strode defiantly. He had already called on those of his soldiers who would stand by him to step forward out of ranks, and he was prepared to make Sewell Mountain a second Thermopylae, regardless of all the articles of war and every paragraph of the military regulations. It was amusing in retrospect, of course, but it was a terrible experience for a man like Lee, who had dealt only with soldiers taught to make discipline their religion. That night Lee bivouacked on the mountainside covered by his overcoat, for his wagon had not come up, and the next morning he gathered what information he could concerning the alleged operations of the enemy on the roads north and south of Sewell Mountain.
All the reports he could collect were that the enemy was not moving in either direction. It was probable, then, that the main force was in front of Wise and might remain there. If that should be the case, then, obviously the thing to do was to bring up Floyd and fight on the ground Wise had chosen. But to this course there was one objection, political rather than military, but serious nonetheless, Wise had staked his reputation on Sewell Mountain, Floyd on Meadow Bluff. To order Floyd to come to Wise, after Wise had refused to go to Floyd, would be regarded by Floyd as a distinct rebuff. Not only so, but it would affect the officers and men as well, for they were almost as much the partisans of their respective leaders as if the two veteran politicians had been pitted against each other in a formal military campaign. Two years later, of course, Lee would not have permitted such a consideration to weigh in his decision, but the war was young in 1861, the politicians were powerful, and Lee had been sent out to harmonize differences, not to aggravate them. What, then, should he do? As tactfully as he could, he wrote General Floyd of his conclusion that the enemy was not moving against him, though a rough roundabout road was practicable for an alert enemy and should be watched. Then he added, I suppose if we fall back the enemy will follow. This is a strong point if they will fight us here. The advantage is, they can get no position for their artillery, and their men I think will not advance without it. If they do not turn it, how would it do to make a stand here? In that event we shall require provisions and forage. Of the latter there is none, and the horses are suffering. This command is now in movable condition, and can retire or remain at pleasure. This was not an order, but it hinted very broadly at one. Would Floyd comply or would he be as stubborn as Wise had been? If Floyd acquiesced and swallowed his pride of opinion, would he come forward promptly before the Federals attacked or would he emulate his rival's action at the time of the advance from White Sulphur and march only when he must? And if he came, how would it be possible to reconcile him and Wise or to get their troops to fight side by side? The answer came most unexpectedly in a dispatch to Lee from Floyd later in the day of the 25th, while the enemy was demonstrating and Wise was at the front. This dispatch contained a copy of an order for General Wise sent under cover to Floyd. It read as follows. War Department, C. S. A. Richmond, September 20, 1861. Brig General Henry A. Wise. Gully River, Vale Lewisburg, Virginia. Sir, you are instructed to turn over all the troops heretofore immediately under your command to General Floyd and report yourself in person to the adjutant general in the city with the least delay. In making the transfer to General Floyd you will include everything under your command. By order of the President. J. P. Benjamin. Acting Secretary of War. Lee forwarded this paper to General Wise without comment. Explicit as were the terms of the order, Wise debated whether to obey or to defy the War Department as he had already defied Floyd and carry on for the time a war of his own. In his hesitation he wrote Lee, asking his judgment. Lee replied promptly and, of course, urged Wise's immediate compliance with the instructions from Richmond. Wise thereupon drafted a farewell to his men, announcing his recall and stoutly affirming that when the president instructed that he be relieved, Davis could not have foreseen that the order would be received when the troops were in the face of the enemy in hourly expectation of attack. Privately, Wise is said to have affirmed that he relinquished command because Lee so advised and not because the War Department so ordered. A few hours afterwards he left for Richmond. In departing from Lee's immediate supervision, he did not pass out of his life. He was to serve with him in after months and was to share the ordeal of Appomattox in precisely the spirit he displayed on Sewell Mountain. The conditions that forced President Davis to recall Wise had been a military scandal for days before the chief executive acted. Wise had made no bones of his distrust of Floyd's judgment, and even in his official correspondence he had indulged in language that no superior could overlook, even on the part of a politician general. He had actually written Lee of Floyd, I feel, if we remain together, we will unite in more wars than one. Public men had written Davis warning him that the cause would suffer, the Kanawha Valley, said one, is too little to hold two generals. Those who do the fighting and the people through the country have not such confidence in the qualifications of the generals as will cause them to flock to their standard and remain and fight with spirit.
said another, Wise and Floyd are as inimical to each other as men can be, and from their course and actions, I am fully satisfied that each of them would be highly gratified to see the other annihilated. The President, on September 12, had authorized Lee, if he saw fit, to transfer Wise's command from Floyd and replace it with other troops. Lee must have thought that this would magnify the evil, for he had taken no action. Colonel Taylor was of opinion that Lee purposely abstained from attempting to pass on the equities of the controversy between Floyd and Wise. The adjutant believed that if Lee did not actually advise such a course, he knew of Mr. Davis's inclination to summon Wise to Richmond. Mr. Davis's growing willingness to take the political risks and to recall Wise as a military necessity was probably quickened into final action by a letter written him on September 15 by Floyd. This was restrained in language, but dwelt on the peculiar contrariness of Wise's character and disposition and left the matter in Davis's hands with the assertion that Wise's presence was almost as injurious as if he were in the camp of the enemy with his whole command. After reading that, Davis had to relieve Wise or else supplant Floyd. He could not afford to let Floyd's letter remain unheeded with an offensive by the enemy immediately in prospect. Three days of uncertainty followed Wise's departure. As the enemy gave every inclination of attacking at any hour, Lee proceeded to fortify the position. Meantime, he made every preparation for retreat in case he found it impracticable to hold his ground. In the midst of this labor Lee had another visitation from the rain demon that had pursued him from the time he had left Staunton, two months before. A downpour on the 27th swept away the bridges, turned the roads into morasses, and cut off the troops at Sewell Mountain from Floyd's support and from all supplies. The country furnished nothing. In some places, wrote Chaplain Quintard, every trace of the road had been so completely washed away that no one would dream that any had ever been where were then gullies eight or ten or even fifteen feet deep. The situation was relieved in part, but only in part, on the 29th, by the arrival of the vanguard of Loring's little army of nine thousand. Thereafter Lee had greatest strength, as he wrote Floyd, sufficient men to meet any attack the enemy was apt to make. He found it exceedingly difficult, however, to procure food for the men and provender for the horses, to say nothing of building up a reserve supply for an offensive. It was the story of Valley Mountain grimly repeated. Troops and horses lived only from day to day, the soldiers still dogged by sickness, the animals so thin they manifestly would break down under heavy duty. Lee looked to Floyd for supplies, Floyd did what he could to forward them, still convinced in his own mind that Meadow Bluff was the proper position for the army. If all the Confederates were gathered at that point, he argued, and the Federals were immediately in their front, the Union forces would have to negotiate the twelve wretched miles of mud through which the Southern Teamsters dragged their wagons to Sewell Mountain. What should Lee do with his enlarged army? Obviously, in a country that presented such formidable natural barriers, it was far better to meet an attack than to deliver one. If they would attack us, one newspaper correspondent wrote, we could whip them without, perhaps, the loss of a man, but, if we had to attack them, the thing will be different. So thought Lee, who for once was in agreement with the press, and so he explained when Chaplain Quintard stopped to chat with him one day when he came to bring a package from Mrs. Lee. Why, General, said Quintard, in the fine disregard of 1861 for the military proprieties, there are the Federals. Why don't we attack them? Ah, said Lee, gently, it is sometimes better to wait until you are attacked. In case the enemy did not assume the offensive, the Confederates could do so by several routes to the rear of Rosecrans, provided the necessary supplies were available. On September 30th Lee wrote Floyd, I begin to fear the enemy will not attack us. We shall therefore have to attack him. Almost immediately, however, the Federals showed activity, as if they might throw their regiments against Sewell Mountain at any time. From day to day Lee waited for them to do so, and waited with greater resignation, because no reserve of supplies to sustain an offensive was being accumulated at Sewell Mountain. Driving power was lacking somewhere, and the wagon trains were inadequate. The first few days of October slipped by. The enemy still busied himself as if for an attack, and showed no signs of attempting any turning movement, the staggering teams delivered just enough food to keep the men from actual hunger and just enough forage to save the horses from starvation. On the night of October 5-6, it seemed as if Lee's decision to await the enemy's attack was to be rewarded.
the pickets heard the creaking of wheels on the mountain and concluded that the Federals were moving up their guns, which had been most unfavorably placed. A Federal advance against Lee's strong works meant slaughter for the Bluecoats and certain victory of the Southerners. The artillery would mow down the Union troops, the infantry would finish off those that escaped the cannon. Lee must have awaited dawn on October 6 in expectancy almost as high as that he had cherished in the mist of September 12, when he rode out on the western ridge above Tigert's Valley in the hope of hearing Rust's opening volley. When day came there was silence. For a time it seemed ominous, then it became suspicious. Presently, when full light came over the ridges and the enemy's trenches could be seen, not a Federal soldier was visible. While Lee had waited for Rosecrans to attack, Rosecrans had reasoned in precisely the same fashion that it was better to receive assaults than to deliver them. Despairing at length of having that advantage, he had decided not to throw away his own men and had prudently chosen to shorten his line of communications for the approaching winter. During the night, he had slipped away. The wheels that had been heard were those of a withdrawing wagon train, not those of advancing artillery. Lee immediately organized a pursuit, but the horses were too weak to carry the cavalry far, and the hungry, shivering infantry started without provisions and had no chance of overcoming the lead that Rosecrans's silent retreat had given him. The weather, once again, was on the side of the thickest coat. Dejected, disappointed, and empty-handed, the Confederates had to march back to the wind and cold of Sewell Mountain. Not unreasonably, the escape of the Federals without the loss of a man was accounted another failure for Lee, but it did not provoke any violent press criticism. One favorable opportunity to expel the enemy has been lost, said the examiner. Shall we lose another? General Lee is able and accomplished. In this campaign accidents have baffled his best plans. He has been delayed by incessant rain and unfathomable mud. After two disasters to our arms in that section, he may well have been cautious lest a third should finally ruin our interests there. But excessive caution or malignant chance has wrought, by mere delay, much of the mischief that was dreaded from defeat. The general, we doubt not, now feels the necessity of a more adventurous policy, and he is quite able, we hope, of adapting his plans to the exigency. We look to him and his brave army now for movements and for successes equal to those which have overthrown invasion and treason in Missouri. Lee took this and the earlier newspaper criticism as philosophically as he could. I am sorry, as you say, he confided to Mrs. Lee just after Rosecrans slipped away, that the movements of our armies cannot keep pace with the expectations of the editors of the papers. I know they can arrange things satisfactory to themselves on paper. I wish they could do so in the field. No one wishes them more success than I do, and would be happy to see them have full swing. General Floyd has three editors on his staff. I hope something will be done to please them. Without waiting for the approval of the armchair strategists, Lee drafted a new plan of advance on the very day of Rosecrans's retreat and delivered the preliminary orders for its execution. The promptness with which he fashioned this plan demonstrated a greater facility than he had thus far exhibited in coordinating staff and line to execute his projects. His hope now was to move Floyd quietly from Meadow Bluff to the south of the Kanawha and to have him advance to a point where he could cut the communications of the Federals on the Gully. Lee was then to press forward to the Gully, attack the enemy, and, with Floyd's help, drive them out of the Kanawha Valley. Late as the season was, the success of his plan would achieve one main purpose of the campaign in that it would free the more fertile part of western Virginia of the enemy. Floyd Dooley set out with all the troops under his immediate command except Wise's legion, which he told the Secretary of War he found to be in such a state of insubordination and so ill-disciplined as to be for the moment unfit for military purposes. But no sooner were the soldiers on the march than obstacles to the execution of the strategic plan were encountered. Sickness still thinned the ranks. One North Carolina regiment was reduced to 200 effectives. The departure of Floyd's wagon train so curtailed the transport that the horses had no forage and the troops on Sewell Mountain lived literally from barrel head to frying pan. The weather was so cold that Lee himself, who usually disregarded both heat and chill, had to propose one night that he and Taylor pool their blankets and sleep together under them. As for the roads, one of the editors on Floyd's staff affirmed that the like of them had never been seen. Between the two Sewells, Big Sewell and Little Sewell, he wrote, they are impassable to any single team.
It requires six horses to move a two-horse load, and then it is a slow and tedious business. It is almost impossible for a horse to move out of a walk from General Floyd's to General Lee's camp, and before we could take up our march yesterday, we had to cut a new road nearly four miles long. If a single wagon stalls the whole rear train has to stop until the vehicle is dragged out of the mud, for in many places, the road is so narrow that not even a horse, and sometimes not a footman, can pass a single wagon. Besides all this, General H. R. Jackson, on the Greenbrier, had been attacked by a considerable force on October 3, and though he had very handsomely beaten off the enemy, the movement of the Federals in that quarter might be the first step in a new offensive directed against Staunton and the Virginia Central Railroad. If this were so, Loring would have to return to support H. R. Jackson before Floyd could be in a position to strike at the enemy's communications. And, finally, if all the other difficulties were overcome, there was soon no prospect of surprise. For the newspapers had learned of Lee's plan and were printing the precise details of what was intended to be a secret move. On October 20, two weeks after the preliminary orders had been issued to Floyd, Lee gave up the idea of an offensive and ordered Loring back to H. R. Jackson. Floyd took this in very bad part, protesting that Lee remained idle when an advance would have made it almost certain that they could have captured the whole of the Federal Army. Lee, however, was fully satisfied that the Confederates could not and that the Federals would not advance during the few days of open weather that remained, so he completed the evacuation of Sewell Mountain and sent Wise's Legion back to Meadow Bluff, after all. Even the sanguine Floyd began to intersperse his optimistic dispatches with essays on winter quarters. The campaign in the Kanawha Valley was over, in barrenness and disappointment. There remains, but to review it. Lee had been right, from the outset, in reasoning that Rosecrans intended to strike for the railway. On the very day that Lee had reached Huntersville and had cautioned Floyd to be on his guard against a federal drive on the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad, Rosecrans had announced to Scott his intention of striking for Wytheville on that line. In so far, then, as Lee may have so disposed the forces of Wise and Floyd as to discourage this offensive, he accomplished the negative object of his mission. The same thing may be said, indeed, of the general result of his operations on the Huntersville sector and in the country of the Kana, the disaffection of the people, the difficulties of the terrain, the mud, the sickness, the feebleness of the transport, the absence of accurate information of the enemy, the inexperience of the officers, the jealousy of Loring, and the rivalries of Floyd and Wise constituted such an obstacle that Lee is to be credited with some measure of success in that. With negligible losses, he kept the enemy from reaching the railroad. On the other hand, speaking again more strictly of the Kanaw operations, he did little to achieve a positive result. In his plan to meet Rosecrans's anticipated advance on September 2425, his reasoning was strategically sound. Again, though he may have contributed little to the drastic settlement by President Davis of the controversy between Floyd and Wise, he yielded far less to their pride and peculiarities than he had to Loring's jealousy at Huntersville. He took command with no apologies and with no exaggerated regard for the sensibilities of the two rivals. He soon stopped addressing General Floyd as commanding Kana Army and wrote to him as commanding on Meadow Bluff. That was progress for an amiable man. Lee cannot fairly be criticized for waiting from September 29 to October 6 for Rosecrans to attack. But his operations after October 6, when the launching of an offensive depended on the quick accumulation of supplies, raise a doubt. There is not a line in the dispatches that discloses an energetic effort to overcome the badness of the roads or the feebleness of the transport. If he considered the prospect of an offensive hopeless, there was little point in permitting Floyd to begin his march or to undertake the second advance. If there was a chance of a successful drive, Lee displayed a willingness to wait on the wagon trains that can be given no less a name than inertia. As a strategist, he showed himself facile, but in all that pertained to the commissariat, he seems to have been well-nigh supine at this time. The rains appear to have washed away his initiative. Whether the difficulties were so great that it was futile to attempt to overcome them is a question not easily decided on the basis of what is now known of the condition of the roads and wagon trains. After October 6, Lee himself believed he could accomplish nothing by assuming the offensive or by continuing the pursuit of Rosecrans.
he told General William E. Stark at a later time that a battle would have been without substantial result, that the Confederates were 70 miles from their rail base, that the roads were almost impassable, that it would have been difficult to procure two days' food, and that if he had attacked and beaten Rosecrans, he would have been compelled to retire because he could not provision his army. But, said Stark, your reputation was suffering, the press was denouncing you, your own state was losing confidence in you, and the army needed a victory to add to its enthusiasm. Lee only smiled sadly, I could not afford to sacrifice the lives of five or six hundred of my people to silence public clamor, he said. And there he left it. In honor or in discredit, all this was behind Lee after October 20th, and nothing was to be gained by remaining in the mountains. He had been contemplating a return to Richmond from the time of Rosecrans's retreat on October 6, and he now waited only to visit the hospitals at Lewisburg and White Sulphur in order to do what he could for the comfort of the sick. On October 30th, he turned his horse's head eastward to the Virginia Central Railroad and left Western Virginia, left it to the enemy. Failure to drive Rosecrans out had strengthened the Unionists and cowed the secessionists. Already, on October 24, a majority had voted to establish a separate state and West Virginia was lost to the Confederacy and to the Old Dominion. Lee had no further part in the puny, futile efforts made to recover the fringe of the revolted territory, and he saw no more of Loring or of Floyd. Loring served with Stonewall Jackson in the winter of 1861-1862 and subsequently fought in the far south. Circumstance and an adventurous spirit later carried him to Egypt, where, in 1875-1876, he commanded the Khedive's troops in the war with Abyssinia. Not long after Lee's departure General Floyd was transferred to the army of General Albert Sidney Johnston and, at the time of the disaster of February 15, 1862, was in immediate command of Fort Donelson. He later was put in charge of the Virginia State Line in southwest Virginia, but died in August, 1863. On the afternoon of October 31, accompanied by Taylor, Lee reached the Confederate capital. He had been gone a little more than three months, and during that time he had suffered greatly in prestige, not only in the opinion of the fire-eaters who were perpetually preaching an offensive policy, but also, and equally, in the eyes of the general public. There was little or no new criticism in the press, but cynics began to call him Granny Lee and affirmed that his reputation was based on an impressive presence and an historic name rather than on ability as a field commander. Months later, when E. A. Pollard sketched the West Virginia operations in his first year of the war, he contemptuously declared, the most remarkable circumstance of this campaign was, that it was conducted by a general who had never fought a battle, who had a pious horror of guerrillas, and whose extreme tenderness of blood induced him to depend exclusively upon the resources of strategy to essay the achievement of victory without the cost of life. This expressed the prevailing opinion, which seemed justified by the poor showing Lee had made. In the atmosphere created by the victory at Manassas, public expectation had outrun achievement, and Lee, along with his campaign, was written down as one of the disappointments of the war. In retrospect, Lee regarded the whole campaign as having been a forlorn hope from the outset, but at the time he made no excuses, offered no apologies, and prepared no report, because any recital of what had happened would of necessity uncover Loring's delay and Rust's mistake in the foolish, well-nigh fatal quarrels between Wise and Floyd. Lee's code of honor did not countenance self-indication at the expense of others. His sense of duty to the South made him unwilling, besides, to stir up strife where unity was essential to the successful conduct of the war. He might have been named a bureau chief or an assistant secretary of war, he may have been shelved, as many another officer of early reputation was, at some station where the risks were less than the honors, his first campaign might have been his last, but for the faith President Davis had in him. When Lee called on the president, after his return to Richmond, he was received with the same dignified cordiality Davis had shown before the failure. There was nothing in Davis's manner to indicate that his confidence in Lee had in the least been impaired. Observing that Lee volunteered no report and was disposed to take all the blame without protest, Davis pressed Lee for the details of what had happened. Lee was loath even then to speak and exacted a promise that nothing would be said publicly in censure of those who had failed. When Davis pledged this, Lee reviewed the campaign verbally. The political experience of the president gave him quick and ready understanding of Lee's difficulties with Wise and Floyd. His knowledge of war made him put full valuation, or more than full valuation, on the other obstacles Lee had encountered.
the interview ended with the president as convinced as ever both of the high character and of the high ability of the man at whom the people already were sneering. Chapter 36, An Easy Lesson in Combating Sea Power His report to the president having been made, the first personal concern of General Lee on his return to Richmond was to visit his wife, whom he had not seen since he had left her at Arlington on April 22, more than six months before. From Ravensworth, Mrs. Lee had gone to visit friends in Loudoun, Fauquier, and Clark counties, at Kinloch, Annafield, Maida, and Audley. She had been brave in her separation from the home in which she had spent almost all her life, and after she had moved twice she had humorously declared, greatly to her husband's amusement, that the enemy would have to take her, as she would shift her abode no more. She had changed her mind, however, and with Robert and Mary, about September 15, she had traveled to the hot springs. Lee had been anxious for her to reside for the winter with her daughters at some safe and quiet place in North Carolina or Georgia, but having a will of her own in such matters, she had gone instead to Shirley, where she was sojourning when her husband reached Richmond. The girls were scattered, Mary on a round of visits, Agnes and Annie at Clydale, Dr. Richard Stewart's plantation in King George County, and Mildred at school in Winchester. Robert had unwillingly returned to his studies at the University of Virginia, where his father had seen him en route from Western Virginia. Custis had been taken from his engineering work on the Richmond defenses to perform temporary duty at Goldsboro, and C. Rooney was with his command. It was a delight to Lee to think that his long separation was to be ended in the pleasant atmosphere of his mother's first home, and on November 2 he prepared to go down the river to join Mrs. Lee. Unfortunately, the passenger steamers on the James left in the morning before he could get away, and, as it happened, no government boat was sailing that afternoon. To get to Shirley at all that day, he had to ride, but by the time he got his horse from the stable, darkness was almost upon him and he was unwillingly forced to defer his journey. On Monday, November 4, he conferred at length in the evening with the new Secretary of War, the brilliant Judah P. Benjamin, who had succeeded the overworked and disillusioned L. Pope Walker. The next morning he had an appointment with the President, and before the 5th of November was over, news arrived that postponed to the uncertain future all hope of seeing his wife. A large fleet of federal warships and transports had been gathering in Hampton Roads in October, and on the 20th it had sailed for an unknown destination. On November 1, Secretary Benjamin had received an intimation that the flotillas were bound for Port Royal Sound, South Carolina. This was soon borne out. Nervous reports from the Palmetto State now told of the arrival of the ships at that destination. The departure of the fleet was a relief because it showed that the Federals were not planning an early advance on Norfolk or up the peninsula of Virginia. But any offensive in Port Royal Sound was potentially most serious. The Confederate forces in that quarter were weak on land and almost helpless at sea. The blow seemed to be aimed purposely at a point where the authority of Georgia and of South Carolina met, and it was directed against untrained forces in a rich country that had not yet been inured to the harsher realities of war. Manifestly, the situation would be a difficult one. President Davis for some time had felt that the southern coast needed additional defenses, and he at once directed that it be organized as a single military department. By the same order, and to his complete surprise, Lee was named as commander there. Lee doubtless would have preferred some other assignment, but he was delighted at the prospect of field duty, and he proceeded to make his arrangements for immediate departure. However, his experience in Western Virginia had shown him the dangers of divided command and indefinite authority, and, though contention over rank was repulsive to his nature, he overcame his reticence for once and asked the president what his position and authority would be at his new post. He was told instanter that he would go to South Carolina as a full general in the regular army of the Confederacy, the senior officer in the department, and with the entire support of the administration. The embarrassment with which he asked the question and the confused modesty with which he received the answer gave Mr. Davis the impression that Lee did not really know what his status was in the Confederate service. The announcement that Lee had been chosen to command on the threatened southeastern coast of the Confederacy was not received with general favor. Granny Lee, whose tenderness of blood had brought failure in western Virginia, was not the man, in the opinion of many, to conduct a vigorous campaign for the defense of Charleston and Savannah. 
The opposition to him was not voiced in the Richmond press, but it was so strong that Davis deemed it necessary to advise Governor Pickens of South Carolina and the chief malcontent of the southeastern states, Governor Joseph E. Brown of Georgia, that Lee, in his opinion, was the best soldier available for the duty assigned him. Fortunately, Brown had confidence in Lee and so assured the president. There were others, a minority, who held that Lee would vindicate the president's confidence in him. That invaluable diarist J. B. Jones, the rebel war clerk, chronicled Lee's appointment to the defense of Charleston and Savannah and added with assurance, those cities are safe. He continued. General Lee in the streets here bore the aspect of a discontented man, for he saw that everything was going wrong, but now his eye flashes with zeal and hope. Give him time and opportunity, and he will hurl back the invader from his native land, yes, and he will commend the challenge of invasion to the lips of the North. On the morning of November 6, accompanied by a few other officers and attended by Meredith and Perry, Lee left for Charleston, S.C., where he arrived the next day. He did not tarry but hastened by special train to Coosahatchee on the Charleston and Savannah Railroad, the station nearest Port Royal Sound. When he arrived, he learned that a heavy engagement at the entrance to the Sound was in progress between the Federal Fleet and the Southern Forts, Walker and Beauregard. Excitement was fevered. Nobody at Coosahatchee knew what had happened or what was to be expected. The commanding officer of the few Confederate troops in that area, Brigadier General R. S. Ripley, had ridden down the river to ascertain the situation. Lee took horse as quickly as possible and hurried in the same direction. During the evening, he met General Ripley. His news was bad, the Confederates at Fort Walker and Fort Beauregard had been overwhelmed during the day by the fire from the enemy's ships. They had been forced to abandon their crippled guns, and as the United States war vessels could readily cut them off from the mainland, they would have to evacuate their island positions at once. It seemed, at the moment, almost another rich mountain disaster. Lee took hold at once and gave orders for the withdrawal of the garrisons and of their supports from the two islands on which the captured forts had been located. Then he went back to Kusahatchee, established his headquarters in an abandoned house there, organized his staff, and proceeded to make his first hurried survey of a problem that the nature of the country and the scantiness of his resources rendered exceedingly complex. From Georgetown, on Winyan Bay, 60 miles below the boundary line between the two Carolinas, the Atlantic coast is broken by a series of sounds and bays as far south as the mouth of the St. John's River, a distance of fully 300 miles. The inland waterways cut off from the mainland a multitude of islands, some of them mere mudbanks, some of them the fertile plantations of wealthy rice planters and sea island cotton growers. Down to the sounds flow a number of tidal streams, most of which were then navigable for some miles inland. Near the northern end of the most vulnerable part of this coastline was the city of Charleston, center and symbol of the secessionist movement. Toward the southern end was the rich seaport of Savannah, whence annually were shipped thousands of bales of the cotton that was the Confederacy's sole basis of credit in the markets of the world. Between these two cities ran the Charleston and Savannah Railroad, 100 miles in length, crossing a number of rivers that could be ascended by light vessels to within a few miles of the railroad bridges. The Federals had complete control of the waterways, with heavy ships for the deeper channels and gunboats for the upper stretches of the rivers, the Confederates had only four converted steamers, armed with two guns each. Of land forces, Lee found not more than 6,800 between the Savannah River and the defenses of Charleston. Around Savannah were about 5,500, few of whom could be moved, lest Savannah be unduly exposed. All these troops were widely scattered. Some of them were equipped only in part and had scarcely any efficient field artillery. In Lower South Carolina was only one battery. The strength of the enemy was as yet undetermined, but the federal troops were concentrated on well-convoyed transports and could easily be moved to any coastal point selected for attack. What could Lee do? On the coast were a number of permanent fortifications and new batteries. He did not know how strong these were or how competently garrisoned, but if the fate of Forts Beauregard and Walker was any criterion, they could not, in their existing condition, long withstand the fire of the puissant Federal fleet. Up the rivers he did not have heavy guns to oppose, much less to halt, the approach of the gunboats toward the Charleston and Savannah Railroad. He determined, in the instant emergency, on three courses of action. 
The first was to prepare the defenses of Fort Pulaski, of Savannah, and of Charleston for a far more serious bombardment than they had been built to sustain. The second was to obstruct the waterways up whom the Federals might send their ships. The third was to assemble the scattered Confederate forces at the most probable points of Federal advance toward the railroad, and, in case of an early attack, to offer such resistance as he could in the field, beyond the range of the gunboats. Orders were issued accordingly, and as a first step toward reinforcing his all-too-feeble army, he asked the War Department if he could utilize temporarily the various units that were passing through Georgia and South Carolina on their way to other fronts. He was promptly given authority to do this, but was reminded that as most of these troops were without arms, they would be of small value to him. These three measures of immediate defense called for the most intense activity, comparable in many ways to the unrelieved pressure of the mobilization in Virginia. At the outset, fortunately, the Federals showed no signs of leaving their transports or of capitalizing quickly their victory at Port Royal Sound. There were, at the same time, some evidences of encouraging activity and cooperation on the southern side. Brigadier General A. R. Lawton, commanding at Savannah, assured Lee of his gratification at his arrival and pledged support. A hurried visit to Savannah and to Fort Pulaski on November 1011 showed Lee that Lawton meant what he said. Governor Brown did not interfere in the least, though he had been disposed to assert some authority over the Georgia coast and was even now arguing with the War Department, which he much distrusted, concerning the return of Georgia volunteers then in Virginia. A number of trained naval officers had been sent to the department and were promptly dispatched to Charleston, to Georgia, and to Florida, where they quickly performed admirable service in obstructing the inland waterways. In addition, the blockade runner Fingal came into Savannah on November 13 with a cargo of arms and munitions, from which Lee was authorized to take 4,500 Enfield rifles for the use of such new troops as he could collect in Georgia and South Carolina. As soon as the first defensive measures were underway, Lee determined to make the most of the continued federal inactivity and personally to inspect the coast defenses. He went first to Charleston, where he wished to see Governor Pickens about the enlistment of South Carolina state troops in Confederate service. He was there November 1315 and part of November 16. Conditions were better in the Carolina cities than farther south. In the harbor forts Lee found the best-trained artillerists in the department. They were quite capable of giving the Federal naval gunners shell for shell, but unfortunately, were so few in number and entrusted with so vital a defense that it was doubtful whether any of them could be transferred to other endangered points. Officers at Charleston were not in every instance so well qualified as the enlisted personnel. The work of obstructing the nearby streams was not progressing rapidly enough. Showing none of the hesitancy that had marked his dealings with the sensitive leaders in western Virginia, Lee shifted a few men of doubtful capacity or questionable habits, placed Captain D. N. Ingram of the Navy in general charge of the armament of the batteries, and determined as soon as practicable to name General Ripley to command the Charleston district. Lee avoided all publicity in the historic Old Carolina port and very cautiously refrained from any discussion of his plans, but there was one man, at least, whose inspection he did not escape. Paul Hamilton Hayne was sitting on the parapet of Fort Sumter, observing the sunset, as poets and philosophers should, when Lee arrived to examine the work. In the midst of the group, wrote Hayne, topping the tallest by half a head was, perhaps, the most striking figure we had ever encountered, the figure of a man seemingly about fifty-six or fifty-eight years of age, erect as a poplar, yet lithe and graceful, with broad shoulders well thrown back, a fine justly proportioned head posed in unconscious dignity, clear, deep, thoughtful eyes, and the quiet, Dauntless step of one every inch the gentleman and soldier. Had some old English cathedral crypt or monumental stone in Westminster Abbey been smitten by a magician's wand and made to yield up its knightly tenant restored to his manly vigor, we thought that thus would he have appeared, unchanged in aught but costume and surroundings. In a spirit less romantic, General Lee held a long conference on the night of November 15 with Governor F. W. Pickens, who came down from Columbia to Charleston for that purpose. Lee wanted five additional regiments of South Carolina troops mustered into Confederate service from the state force that Pickens was maintaining. The question to be decided was how the troops were to be armed and for what term they were to be enlisted. This South Carolinians preferred, in the main, the service of their state to that of the Confederacy, but they were anxious to fight.
Pickens could arm only a part of them, but the War Department refused to issue rifles to any that did not enlist, as units, for the duration of the war. In a single interview, Lee and Pickens agreed on a compromise, South Carolina was to arm two regiments, or the equivalent, of men willing to serve until peace was declared, and Lee was to issue 2,500 of the Enfields received on the Fingal to South Carolina commands who pledged a similar period of enlistment. Orders to this effect were issued on November 16, and Lee returned to Coosahatchee. He waited there only long enough to send Ripley to Charleston and to issue a few necessary instructions. Then he hurried on to Savannah, arriving after midnight on the 17th, and proceeded thence on a two-day inspection of the Brunswick District and the northern part of the east coast of Florida. The examination of these scattered defenses led to the most important decision of Lee's entire stay in the department. He was satisfied, from what he saw, that it was impracticable to defend all the islands and waterways with the forces he then had or could reasonably hope to muster. He accordingly determined on three related steps, first, to withdraw all the guns and garrisons from the minor, outlying positions, second, to strengthen still further and, if possible, to hold the entrance to Cumberland Sound, the approaches to Brunswick, Fort Pulaski, Savannah, and Charleston, and, third, to construct in front of Savannah and the lower end of the Charleston and Savannah Railroad a deep interior line, so drawn that he could concentrate and hold it with the troops at his disposal, while compelling the enemy to fight where the heaviest guns of the warships could not be used. In making this last decision, Lee may have been influenced to some extent by his father's strategical theories. While Lee was a small boy, Light Horse Harry had once talked with Charles Carter Lee about the defense of the Atlantic seaboard, specifically of Virginia, against an enemy that controlled the sea. The elderly had then said that in case of an attack up the rivers, it would be desirable to withdraw the armed forces from the waterfront and to take up a line far enough back from the streams to make the guns of the ships useless. Charles Carterly doubtless had told his younger brother of his father's views. The orders for the withdrawal from the more exposed positions generally issued on the ground at the time of his inspection, and he appealed to the War Department to supply his greatest immediate need, that of artillerists and qualified instructors in gunnery. For the improvement of the defenses, which he pronounced poor indeed, he laid off enough work, as he wrote two of his daughters, to employ our people for a month. He added, I hope the enemy will be polite enough to wait for us. It is difficult to get our people to realize their position. The decision to organize the defense by these successive steps was made about November 19 and was the basis of all that Lee did during the remainder of his service on the southeastern coast. Every day there were new vexations, new developments, new complications, but every day there was effort to speed up the work on the principal forts and obstructions, to further the preparation of the inner line, and to procure and train more troops. It was an unromantic routine of duty, dirt, and drudgery. His ultimate hope, through it all, was that if he built up his force and his fortifications sufficiently, the Federals would be unwilling to leave their ships. In the arduous work of persuading proud Southern soldiers to bend their backs to pick and shovel, Lee was greatly aided by the singular irresolution of the commander of the Federal Land Force, Brigadier General Thomas W. Sherman. Until November 24, no movement by the enemy interrupted Lee's preparations. Then Flag Officer DuPont landed a force and occupied a part of Tybee Island at the mouth of the Savannah River, which Lee had evacuated. Lee did not turn aside on this account, nor was he especially alarmed. The work of strengthening Fort Pulaski had not progressed so rapidly as he had wished, to be sure, but the river had been obstructed, and Fort Jackson, close to Savannah, had been armed. Lee did not believe that the passage of the river could be forced and have attached little importance to the seizure of any of the islands, reasoning that the enemy could easily take any of them that the fleet could approach, but that, having pillaged them, the Federals would not find it worthwhile to hold them. There was, in fact, no certainty in his mind, as yet, that the main attack was to be on Savannah. He sent special warning to General Ripley to be on the alert at Charleston while the Federals were rejoicing over the seizure of Tybee Island. The digging of the inner line involved close daily inspection. Lee took it upon himself to supervise the work in front of Kusahachi, where the enemy could bring his gunboats close to the railroad. When not directly engaged there, he would visit some other part of the line, returning to headquarters for dinner at early candlelight and then working over his official papers until 11 o'clock or midnight. It was a grueling pace. 
One day he covered 115 miles, 35 of them on Greenbrier, a young gray horse he had seen in western Virginia and had purchased when his owner's command had joined Lee in Carolina. The strength and endurance of this fine animal won him the reputation of being a fine traveler and ere long his old name was dropped and he became simply traveler. Often Lee rode alone on Traveler to make inspections and, as a lover of horses, frequently visited the stables and examined the animals attached to the batteries. His comings and goings were so unostentatious that many of the men did not know him. Once he passed a sergeant and a teamster on his rounds. The sergeant duly saluted him, but the teamster, who happened to be deaf, at once inquired of his companion in a loud voice, I say, sergeant, who is that derned old fool? He's always a pokin' round my horses as if he meant to steal one of them. On December 2, Lee's journey was down Broad River to organize a light force to cope with marauding parties that were doing much damage to the estates of the planters, despite General Sherman's orders to the contrary. Three days later, Lee was at Palmetto Point, where he had a distant view of the fleet, the future movements of which he was hourly pondering. Then, following a feudal demonstration by the Federals in the vicinity of Gardens Corner, he went to Charleston again on December 11. That visit gave him a touch of the social life he so much enjoyed, for he put up at the Mills House, where he met a number of ladies, including the wife of Major A. L. Long, formerly of Loring's Army, who had been named on the general staff at Lee's headquarters. While Lee was chatting very cheerfully in the parlor of the hotel, a great fire swept swiftly across the city and almost cut off escape from the hotel before Lee was conscious of the proximity of the flames. The members of his party had to make their way down a rear stairs, half-choked with smoke, to reach the open air. Lee insisted on carrying the baby of one of the ladies in his arms and left his baggage to the flames. Fortunately, the hotel escaped destruction, and Lee and his staff found quarters in the home of Charles Alston on the Battery. Lee's ready reception at the Alston mansion was typical of the place he had quickly won for himself in South Carolina. His reticence concerning his military plans was generally remarked, but his bearing, his activity, his determination to save Charleston from the enemy, and the manifest wisdom of his military arrangements, together with the fact that he was the son of a distinguished defender of South Carolina, made a most favorable impression apparently on everyone, with the sole exception of General Ripley. This officer, a native of Ohio and a graduate of West Point, had resigned from the army in 1853 and had entered business in Charleston, the home of his wife. He was portly, of commanding presence, and, except to his friends, was of a pompous manner. A sworn enemy of red tape, he was, as General Beauregard later maintained, of restless and insubordinate nature and for some unknown reason took a violent dislike to Lee. With the self-control that always marked his acts, Lee ignored Ripley's peculiarities and made the most of his abilities. For nearly a week, Lee studied the city's defenses. He placed new obstructions in the rivers and he changed batteries without removing guns from the principal forts, which he insisted on keeping at full armament in view of the possibility that the enemy contemplated an attack. Already, he had set up Charleston and its environs as one of the five districts into which he had divided his department. Before he had completed this work at Charleston, there came a letter from the Adjutant General of the State, with the approval of the Governor, placing all the troops of the State at his disposal, without reservation. This was a triumph of diplomacy and honest effort. Lee had already received 1,400 reinforcements from other states, and soon after he returned to Coosahatchee on December 17 he had notice from Richmond that six regiments of infantry, the Phillips Legion, and two batteries of field artillery were moving to his support. Some of these troops had already been under his command in western Virginia. This increment and the pledge of the Carolina State forces greatly improved his prospects, though he was still embarrassed by the shortage of artillery and by the rival purchasing of state and Confederate troops in the same territory. Numerical superiority in land forces was shifting, for once, to the Confederate, but on the rivers and deep estuaries, heavy guns were needed to combat the Federal fleet. Lee accordingly began a series of deferential but continuous appeals to the War Department for more large-caliber ordnance. Lee was engaged in correspondence on the subject and was pushing hard for the completion of the inner line when he received announcement on December 20 of an event that was later materially to modify his strategic plan. General Ripley telegraphed that federal warships had convoyed to Charleston more than a dozen old ships loaded with stone and had sunk these in the main ship channel.
It was an act that angered Lee as much as almost any happening of the entire war. This achievement, he wrote the Secretary of War, so unworthy of any civilized nation, is the abortive expression of the malice and revenge of a people which it wishes to perpetuate by rendering more memorable a day hateful on their calendar, the anniversary of the secession of South Carolina. Fortunately for the Port of Charleston, the sinking of the Stone Fleet, as it was called, closed only one of the three ship channels. It served an almost useful purpose in that it indicated to the Confederates that the enemy apparently wished to bottle up Charleston and had no immediate intention of attacking there. Lee, however, did not consider that the action of the enemy lessened the necessity of making Charleston as strong as possible. Fearing, rather, that it might result in a relaxation of effort, he prodded Ripley more vigorously than ever to complete the defenses. At the same time, he felt that Ripley would now have opportunity of employing some of his force to protect nearby islands and to break up predatory raids. In a larger strategic view, he made ready to meet an attack farther south. Subsequently, he wavered once or twice in this belief, but increasingly he concentrated his forces and centered his defensive measures on the Savannah sector. In the midst of these preparations, Lee came to the first Christmas of the war. After distributing a few gifts to the children of his officers and to his servants, he devoted the greater part of the day to writing a series of characteristic letters to the members of his family, with whom he had not had many opportunities of corresponding since he had come to South Carolina. Mrs. Lee had been to Richmond after he had left and had gone to the White House, where Annie had joined her. Rooney and Charlotte were also there. These four were the only members of the family who could spend Christmas in the old way. To one of his daughters, he enclosed a gift of money and some violets plucked from the garden of his headquarters. May God guard and preserve you for me, my dear daughter, he wrote. Among the calamities of war the hardest to bear, perhaps, is the separation of families and friends. Yet all must be endured to accomplish our independence and maintain our self-government. In my absence from you, I have thought of you very often and regretted I could do nothing for your comfort. Your old home, if not destroyed by our enemies, has been so desecrated that I cannot bear to think of it. I should have preferred it to have been wiped from the earth, its beautiful hill sunk, and its sacred trees buried, rather than to have been degraded by the presence of those who revel in the ill they do for their own selfish purposes. This was natural resentment, born of loss and separation, but it was no sooner expressed than his old self-control was asserted, you see what a poor sinner I am, he added at once, and how unworthy to possess what was given me, for that reason it has been taken away. I pray for a better spirit, and that the hearts of our enemies may be changed. He must have rebuked himself for his mild outburst, for when he came to write Mrs. Lee, later in the day, it was in complete mastery of his emotions, I cannot let this day of rejoicing pass, dear Mary, he began, without some communication with you. I am thankful for the many among the past that I have passed with you, and the remembrance of them fills me with pleasure. For those on which we have been separated, we must not repine. If it will make us more resigned and better prepared for what is in store for us, we should rejoice. Now we must be content with the many blessings we receive. If we can only become sensible of our transgressions, so as to be fully penitent and forgiven, that this heavy punishment under which we labor may with justice be removed from us and the whole nation, what a gracious consummation of all that we have endured it will be. He wrote next of his daily routine and of Mrs. Lee's visit to Richmond, but he could not keep his mind from the old mansion where they had spent Christmas in so much cheer and other, happier years. As to our old home, he said, if not destroyed, it will be difficult ever to be recognized. Even if the enemy had wished to preserve it, it would almost have been impossible. With the number of troops encamped around it, the change of officers, etc., the want of fuel, shelter, etc., and all the dire necessities of war, it is vain to think of its being in a habitable condition. I fear, too, books, furniture, and the relics of Mount Vernon will be gone. It is better to make up our minds to a general loss. They cannot take away the remembrance of the spot and the memories of those that to us rendered it sacred. That will remain to us as long as life will last and that we can preserve. Then, as he wrote, the old instinct of home asserted itself. If Arlington was lost, where could the family hope to reside? He did not think of the rich plantations of White House and Roman Cock, but of the dilapidated old mansion associated with the names of his ancestors.
In the absence of a home, he went directly on, I wish I could purchase Stratford. That is the only other place I could go to, now accessible to us, that would inspire me with feelings of pleasure and local love. You and the girls could remain there in quiet. It is a poor place, but we could make enough cornbread and bacon for our support, and the girls could weave us clothes. I wonder if it is for sale and at how much. Ask Fitzhugh to try to find out when he gets to Fredericksburg. Mrs. Lee, it seems, had written to him of the hopes of British intervention that had been aroused by England's quick protest against the action of the Federal Navy in seizing, on November 8, 1861, the Confederate commissioners John Slidell and James M. Mason aboard the British steamer Trent. You must not build your hopes of peace on account of the United States going into a war with England. She will be very loath to do that, notwithstanding the bluster of the northern papers. Her rulers are not entirely mad, and if they find England is in earnest, and that war or a restitution of their captives must be the consequence, they will adopt the latter. We must make up our minds to fight our battles and win our independence alone. No one will help us. We require no extraneous aid, if true to ourselves. But we must be patient. It is not a light achievement and cannot be accomplished at once. In this spirit, he closed a letter that exhibits many of the prime qualities of the man, his self-restraint, his faith in God, his love of home, his logic, and his sense of realities. As he saw great plantations ruined on the Carolina coast and women and children forced to flee and live in poverty, his wrath sometimes rose. Once he protested, no civilized nation within my knowledge has ever carried on wars as the United States government has against us. But this was unusual language for him. The Lee of the long Christmas letter to his wife is the Lee of history. Almost before these Christmas letters had reached their Virginia destination, the decisive year of Lee's life had opened. Before 1862 ended, the general who had never fought a battle was to have for bloody campaigns to his credit, and the people who had shaken their heads at the mention of his name were to be acclaiming him the savior of the South. There was little at Lee's Carolina headquarters to suggest such an early reversal of fortune, but there was much to indicate that a bitter test awaited the Confederacy. The soldiers in Lee's department had reached nearly 25,000, and General Henry R. Jackson, Lee's associate in western Virginia, had assured him of the wholehearted cooperation of the Georgia State troops, the command of which he had assumed. On the other hand, the terms of the earliest one-year South Carolina volunteers were expiring, and the failure of some of them to re-enlist had seriously reduced the strength of the Confederates in the first military district between Little River Inlet and the South Santee River. Lee saw in this the possibility of a ruinous diminution of the Southern armies in the spring of 1862. He had already addressed the president of the South Carolina Convention on the subject, and he now wrote Governor Letcher, urging that Virginia pass a law drafting all one-year volunteers who did not re-enlist for the war. Even immediately, what availed 25,000 men on a coast of 300 miles, when the enemy had it in his power at any time to concentrate all his force against any one objective by using his fleet? As if in warning of what might be expected, the Federals landed 3,000 men at Port Royal Ferry on the very first day of the new year. Although they did no great damage, they demonstrated what Lee pointed out to Governor Pickens when he said, the enemy can be thrown with great celerity against any point and far outnumbers any force we can bring against it in the field. In this situation, Lee pressed as vigorously as ever for the completion of the inner line, the obstruction of the rivers, and the strengthening of the principal forts. At the beginning of the second week in January, he went to Savannah and thence on a tour of the east coast of Florida, stopping at Cumberland Island, where he visited the grave of his father for the first time. He found much discontent in Florida. General Trapier was in controversy with some of the leading men and was anxious to be relieved. The defenses at the south end of Cumberland Island, which Lee thought he should hold, if possible, were inadequately gunned. New ordnance from Virginia had to be solicited for them. Our defenses are growing stronger, but progress slowly, he wrote Custis several days after his return to Coosahatchee on January 16. The volunteers dislike work, and there is much sickness among them besides. Guns too are required, ammunition and more men. Still, on the whole, matters are encouraging and if the enemy does not approach in overwhelming numbers, we ought to hold our ground. He is quite essence still.
What he is preparing for or when he will strike, I cannot discover. A week later, some of this doubt was cleared up when Lee was called to Charleston by the news that another federal fleet had appeared off the harbor. On January 23, the number and purpose of the enemy ships could not be determined because of a storm, but on the 25th and 26th, the weather having cleared, Lee witnessed the sinking of a second stone fleet consisting of twelve old merchantmen. This time it was the Maffet Channel the enemy sought to obstruct, with no other result, Lee thought, than to deter ships from running the blockade at night. Simultaneously with this second attempt to close Charleston Harbor, the Federals began to clear the Confederate obstructions from walls cut on the inland waterway linking Port Royal Sound to the Savannah River. These moves fully convinced Lee that the enemy was preparing for operations somewhere in the vicinity of Savannah. In order that he might be in hourly touch with the preparations for the defense of that city and of Fort Pulaski, Lee went to Savannah on the evening of January 28 and by February 3 had transferred his headquarters there. He found an admiring welcome at the homes of the McKays and the Sorrels, in the hospitality of the Minnie's family, and in a circle of cultivated, sympathizing friends, but he also found that work which should have been finished by this time had lagged terribly, to use his own words, and he had to throw himself into its completion with all his energies. Well, it was for him that in his days as an army engineer he had been forced to give close personal attention to Minushi, for now if he wanted them carried through he had to keep a hundred small projects under his own eye. Fort Pulaski had been vittled for a siege the day Lee had left Kusahachi, he followed this with changes in the bearing of some of its guns and with new calls on the War Department for the quick delivery of additional heavy ordnance for nearer batteries, he had to arrange to withdraw all cannon from the river below the fort, facing attempted profiteering in iron, he was quick to take what the government required and to pay for it at the old price, plans had to be made to induce re. Enlistment for the war by Georgia troops whose terms were about to expire, purperlays had to be opened with Governor Brown for the destruction of Brunswick, a then deserted resort of rich planters which Lee did not want the enemy to occupy, an effort had to be made to get trained artillerists from Charleston in case General Ripley thought they could be transferred without danger to the Carolina city. These constituted only a part of the details to which he had to give his personal attention for a reason he confided to Mrs. Lee, it is so very hard to get anything done, he wrote, and while all wish well and mean well, it is so difficult to get them to act energetically and promptly. While Lee was struggling with inertia, incompetence, and a multitude of troublesome duties, the Confederate cause elsewhere had suffered two disasters. On February 6, Fort Henry, on the lower Tennessee River, was captured by a federal army under a general who then came prominently into the news for the first time, Ulysses S. Grant. A week later, the Union forces, supported by a flotilla of gunboats, invested Fort Donelson at Dover, Tennessee, and on the 15th, after two days hard fighting, forced 15,000 Confederates to surrender. General Gideon Pillow, whom Lee had known in the Mexican War, and General John B. Floyd, who had been sent from western Virginia to Tennessee, contrived to get away. The cavalry escaped also, thanks to the vigilance of Colonel Nathan B. Forrest. In other respects, the disaster was complete and shook the hold of General Albert Sidney Johnston on Tennessee. Almost at the same time, on February 8, General Henry A. Wise, with 3,000 men, was attacked by an overpowering naval and land force at Roanoke Island, N.C., and was driven from the island with the loss or capture of two-thirds of his little command. The whole South was depressed, but Lee received the reports without flinching. The news is not favorable, he said before he heard the worst, but we must make up our minds to meet with reverses and to overcome them. I hope God will at last crown our efforts with success. But the contest must be long and severe, and the whole country must go through much suffering. It is necessary we should be humbled and taught to be less boastful, less selfish and more devoted to right and justice to all the world. The immediate result on Lee's command of the disasters in Tennessee and in North Carolina was a double call from the War Department to withdraw all units from the islands to the mainland for a more concentrated defense with a smaller force, and, secondly, to abandon Florida, except for the line of the Apalachicola River, and to send the troops from that state to General Albert Sidney Johnston. The first of these orders Lee had already anticipated, except for Cumberland Island, and the second he executed promptly. The loss of force amounted to nearly 4,000 men, and the change in the situation meant, of course, that Lee could expect no further reinforcements.
he would be disadvantaged if the Federals made a descent in force, but he made no complaint to the War Department and continued to press with all his energy for the obstruction of the Savannah River and for the better defense of that sector. It seemed likely that the Federals who had seized Roanoke Island would seek to take Norfolk in reverse rather than turn their attention to Charleston. Their movement, however, was sufficiently doubtful for Lee to hold at Charleston the whole of Ripley's force, 4569 effectives, and to study a further contraction of the lines in that quarter. I am in favor, he said, of abandoning all exposed points as far as possible within reach of the enemy's fleet of gunboats and of taking interior positions where we can meet on more equal terms. All our resources should be applied to those positions. Much remained to be done on the Savannah sector, where it was now apparent the enemy was slowly making preparations to deliver his long-delayed offensive. Lee did not believe the troops or the people had been fully aroused to the import of the disaster in Tennessee. In case Savannah were taken, or the railroad were cut, it would be necessary to establish new railroad connections by way of Augusta. Lee urged this strongly on Governor Brown. Obstructions in the Savannah River below Augusta were also desirable as a precautionary measure. Progress had been substantial, but the inner line took form slowly. Anxiety was great as the Federals made ready. When Lee went to church on February 22, the day set aside by the President for fasting and prayer, it was in a deepened conviction that the Southern cause rested in hands more powerful than his own. Many an hour he spent in prayer, many a midnight found him awake and wondering what the Federals were doing in the river. His messages to his family were blends of hope and doubts, a very complete summary of affairs as he saw them, three months and a half after he had come south. I am engaged, he said in one of these letters, in constructing a line of defense at Fort Jackson which if time permits and guns can be obtained, I hope will keep them out. And again. The enemy seems to be slowly making his way to the Savannah River through the creeks and marshes, and his shells now interrupt its navigation. We have nothing that floats that can contend with him, and it is grating to see his progress unopposed by any resistance we can make. The communication with Fort Pulaski is cut. That may in time be reduced, but I am constructing batteries at Fort Jackson which, if our men will fight, will give him trouble to get to the city. His batteries are so numerous and strong that I know they are hard to resist, but if we have the time and guns they ought if vulnerable to be beaten off. The work progresses slowly and it is with the utmost difficulty that it is pushed ahead. The facilities the arms or branches of these waters afford for approach and investment in all directions make it one of the hardest places to defend I ever saw against light draft boats. On March 2, in the same spirit, balancing buts and ifs, he confided to one of his daughters, I have been doing all I can with our small means and slow workmen to defend the cities and coast here. Against ordinary numbers we are pretty strong, but against the hosts our enemies seem able to bring everywhere, there is no calculating. But if our men will stand to their work, we shall give them trouble and damage them yet. On the evening after he wrote this letter, there was handed to Lee a telegram that read as follows. Richmond, Virginia, March 2, 1861. General R. E. Lee. Savannah. If circumstances will, in your judgment, warrant your leaving, I wish to see you here with the least delay. Jefferson Davis. The tone of this message was not that of an order of recall, but in other respects it was as formal and as indefinite as that memorable paper he had received in February, 1861, in Texas. Why did Davis wish to see him? Was it a new command? And why such urgency to have him in Richmond when all signs pointed to an early battle for Savannah? Lee knew no reason for this unexpected summons, but he must have felt it meant his final separation from the coastal command, for he promptly replied that he would leave on the morning of March 4, and he gave special and minute instructions to General Lawton concerning the places that remained to be fortified and the measures that should be taken to halt the further progress of the enemy up the Savannah River. In the belief that an emergency in Richmond had inspired the president's telegram, Lee disposed of these details so quickly that he was able to start on the evening of the 3D instead of on the 4th. With Taylor and his servants he took the train to Charleston and thence, after a day, to Richmond. His mission on the southeastern coast was ended. He never saw Savannah or Cumberland Island or even Charleston again until he went back, eight years later, prematurely aged and nearing his end, to seek escape from the rigors of a winter in the mountains of Virginia.
he had done his work thoroughly. He was fortunate, to be sure, in having as his adversary a man cautious and indecisive, hampered by having to rely for his transport and naval officers who were more interested in maintaining the blockade than in landing an army. He could not have asked a more obliging opponent, one less like the young officer who had used sea power to the fullest in the Fort Donelson campaign. Making the fullest allowance for Sherman's futility and indecision, Lee nevertheless had prevented the development of an offensive that had threatened serious damage to the Confederate cause. Without the loss of a single soldier from the fire of his enemy, he had held off Sherman from the railroad and had put so many difficulties in the way of his advance that the Federals had nowhere moved beyond the cover of their warships. The Unionists battered down Fort Pulaski on April 1011, 1862, as Lee had anticipated they might, but, on the basis of what Lee had initiated, later commanders so strengthened Savannah that the Federals did not think its occupation worth the losses its capture would entail. The Confederate flag waved there until, on December 21, 1864, an abler Sherman took it in reverse, at the end of his march to the sea. The credit for the defensive system that balked the combined federal land and sea forces in front of Savannah belongs to Lee more than to anyone else. The Charleston defenses, however, which held out until February 17, 1865, were not his work. Lee did little to the forts nearest that city and worked chiefly to obstruct adjacent streams and estuaries. General Beauregard had done much for the defenses before he left for Virginia and he later rendered the whole of the fortifications more formidable. Lee's inner line along the coast doubtless was much too elaborate and extended to be held by the limited force subsequently available in the department. This, however, was a virtue at the time the works were thrown up. Having a very small army, but charged with safeguarding a lateral railroad that ran behind the greater part of the line, Lee had to design so strong and so deep a defensive system that it could be held by a few regiments until the arrival of reinforcements by way of the railroad. It is much to be regretted that no complete description of this line exists and that none can be prepared from the records. Lee departed from South Carolina with the curious distinction of having been ten months in command of seriously threatened fronts without having fought a single battle. The deaths from wounds during the whole of his direct control of operations in western Virginia and on the southeastern coast could be counted on the fingers of his right hand. It was a period of preparation for action rather than of action itself, but it was preparation of the most valuable sort. His touch had been more nearly sure. He had not conquered his excessive amiability, as time was to prove, but he had not let it ruin him as a commander. Little of the embarrassment in dealing with grumblers and malcontents that had been shown in western Virginia was apparent in his second command. With Lee as he had been in August, 1861, Ripley might have proved another Loring, for Ripley's language in criticizing his commander was so violent that Governor Pickens complained to President Davis. But Lee went ahead as though Ripley were not antagonistic, and Ripley's slurs, whatever their origin, had no material effect on operations. In close dealings with politicians like Pickens and Brown, Lee was as successful as he had been in winning the good opinion of Letcher of Virginia and vastly more at ease than in dealing with political generals of the Pillow Floydwise types. Much was learned, also, by Lee, while on the coast, about handling larger bodies of men. By successive stages he had come from brief command of a few squadrons of cavalry in Texas to the direction of the unhappy forces in western Virginia, and then to the command of 25,000 men, scattered on a line of 300 miles, and all, to repeat, without having to make quick decisions in the midst of action. He was lucky, moreover, in having an opportunity of studying how a railroad could be utilized for the movement of troops and how it could be defended. He had learned something of new transportation methods, of course, while doing his part in transporting soldiers to Manassas, to Harper's Ferry, and to Norfolk during April-July, 1861, but the responsibility was entirely his in South Carolina and Georgia. It was a useful lesson, well learned, and it convinced him that the proper defense of a railway did not consist in scattering small bodies of men along its entire length, but in guarding strategic bridges and crossings and in concentrating his main force where it could be moved rapidly to endangered points. Finally, this command confirmed Lee's faith in the indispensability of earthworks. Charleston and Fort Pulaski had represented the familiar problems of permanent fortifications, which he had studied for years before the war, the defense of Kusahachi and the inner line at Savannah called for stout works quickly constructed from the materials at hand.
such works had been little used in America before that time and were despised by the Confederate volunteers as representing labor no white man should do and cover behind which no Southerner should take refuge. Lee had believed in digging dirt ever since he had constructed the naval battery at Vera Cruz, and though his men complained all along the coast, he persisted in giving them the protection of field fortification. He could hardly have had better training for the task that awaited him at the Confederate capital to which he now returned.